Uh, so today it will be an extension of what you have uh, already done previously under this uh, pests and diseases of uh, crops. So I think Dr. Anavira and Ms. Achini Devagedara uh, have completed the first two and this will be the extended session of the same uh, module. So it will be the third day and uh, we have uh, three sessions today and uh, all sessions will be conducted by myself. And uh, today we will be talking about uh, pests. So maybe you have uh, studied about diseases as well. So today it will be uh, a kind of a session talking about pests. So maybe you know about pests and uh, pest classifications uh, in the previous uh, lectures. So today, uh, I think it's time to have some more information uh, regarding some major pests. So there are many pests. So there are many number of pests, but it is really difficult to uh, study all. But uh, when it comes to the pests and especially and then uh, today I have gathered some information under different topics so it will be really easy for you to identify uh, what are those pests and uh, why we need to identify their life cycles and their uh, feeding materials and uh, how they are behaving so unless you don't uh, study about their behavior you cannot identify the controlling mechanism as well. So that is why we need to go much in deep in identifying uh, these pests and uh, very briefly I will describe about those. So today in the first one we will be talking about, so I will share the presentation so you can see that the first session will be uh, reserved for talking about major pests of rice, right? if not the uh, paddy. Paddy cultivation. I think you all know that it is a, uh, it is the stable food of Sri Lanka, and uh, that is why we need to identify uh, the import. Out, uh, major pests of rice. Recording in progress. Uh, so, can I know about something about what you know about pests, especially? Who are they? Wh what kind of uh, creatures are known as pests? According to your idea, what, what will be the uh, idea that you are having as a pest? They have three body parts. Uh, yes, they are having so. So, pests are who? So usually we can categorize them into different uh, type of animals. So these are actually animals. But uh, when it comes to their behavior in the morphological context, uh, we can, of course, as you have mentioned, we can identify them as having uh, different body parts that uh, other animals do not have. So that is one thing. And especially these are insects, right? Especially these are insects but uh, in some cases some uh, mammals or some animals more than insects can be again categorized as pests also but uh, today we will be talking about actually these insect types right insect types of pests uh, maybe there are larger scale body parts are there in, in other animals mammals so they are also considered as pests and uh, in what instances we call them as pests How we can identify a pest? Who are they and what are, what are their behaviors? How they can be identified as pests? So actually it is uh, something that you identify from the uh, harming, 
for your crop cultivation or, or some sort of a maybe the livestock. However, so in this case, we will be talking about in crop cultivations. So if somebody, if, if a kind of a creature is damaging your crop, we identify that creature or, or animal, insect or whatever the type as a pest, right? So pests are uh, those who harm our uh, crop cultivations. So whatever the uh, type of uh, a kind of an animal who is harming our crop cultivation will be considered as a pest. So here we will be talking about mainly about these insects, right? Major in pests of rice. So I think you know about the rice plant. So it's uh, belong to the grass family. And uh, when it comes to its production, it's important for our country. So uh, at some point in the past, we have been self-sufficient, but however, uh, there have been much, much uh, problems related to rice or the paddy cultivation. And So this one is one such the pest and diseases, right? Yes, it harm it harms. However, it harms the crops. It damages the crop parts. That is true. That is true. So um, when it comes to this paddy production, the rice production, number of problems are there in our country for the uh, for not having. The optimum amount of uh, production in rice cultivation but however uh, these pests and diseases are very common in rice cultivation and they have contributed much for the uh, under production of this rice so that is why we need to identify so there are a number of pests but uh, we will go through some major pests so they have a capacity to do some more harm other than the others so it is really hard if you do not identify these major pests in a crop cultivation of rice so they will do a massive damage if you do not identify them so that is the reason we need to identify the major pests of rice so uh, these are the major insect pests so today we will be talking about insect pests right so they are considered as Insects. I know. I think you know about insects. So uh, the so-called three body parts will be there in insects, right? So insect pests are uh, they are different. And actually, I think you all know about life cycles. So there, are, there are two main life cycles: the incomplete and the complete life cycles. So we need to identify their own uh, life cycles. And how we can damage the each stage. So that is how uh, mainly, very briefly, if we say, uh, to identify the ways to control them, right? And we, other than that, we need to identify their feeding materials, breeding stages, and where they do their breeding, and in what uh, areas of the plant will be selected by them for their. Uh, as they are resting place or they are living places, right? So these are the things that we need to identify in an insect pest. So brown plant hopper, maybe you have heard about this one. Brown plant hopper, if not, we uh, very briefly we say BPH. If you see uh, BPH in literature, so it says about brown plant hopper, right? I have given the common name and the uh, their uh, scientific name. And uh, yellow stem borer, rice leaf folder, rice gold midge, and paddy bug. So these are very common and major insect pests. So if we do not take action to control them, so they will uh, maybe uh, doing a, a higher infestation. We call infestations in insect pests. Uh, in diseases, we call infections. Right. So diseases are infections. But uh, insect pests, so these pests do infestations. So if you do not identify them in their correct uh, stages to control them, so it will do a massive damage to the 
crop cultivation, the paddy cultivation, right? Right, so these are adults, right? This is how they are usually seen in plants, right? So, uh, when you look at the rice plant, the paddy plant, so I, I have mentioned that it be belongs to the family, uh, the poaceae, if not the grass family, it's a grass, right? So, when it comes to this, uh, the morphology of rice, it is a grass. So, in this specific uh, plant, uh, you will see a stem part of, of course, but it is not a stem. We call it a culm, right? C-U-L-M, culm, uh, because these leaves are having uh, two parts, leaf blade and the leaf sheath, right? Leaf blade and the leaf sheath, but we see as outer leaf is leaf blade, right? Leaf blade and leaf sheaths are uh, wrap around each other and form the culm. So that is the uh, stem part of the rice plant we see right so if you look at the middle section of this culm or the stem part you won't see anything it is not filled with something it is wrapped around with one another and form the culm so it seems like a stem but if you look at the very middle of this stem there's no anything inside filled it is hollow right it's empty so, this type of uh, leaf sheets that are wrapped around each other, so that will be the target area for this brown plant hopper, BPH. Right? So, we say that this one is a phloem feeder. Right? We need to identify the, I, I, I mentioned that we need to identify the feeding material. Right? Uh, yes, so at the end, we will uh, share this uh, materials, right? So that's, that's that will be uh, shared, yes. And uh, so when it comes to identifying their life cycle, so this is known as a phloem feeder. I think you all know about phloem, right? Phloem is a kind of a vascular tissue that we are having in plants. It is mandatory. It should be there. Because it is, it's, it's one of the uh, mandatory vascular systems in a plant. Right? So, can you uh, identify another section which is important in vascular system in a plant? Sila. of the body of the plant so this phloem is one such we have another main one xylem yes xylem true and correct and uh, this xylem right xylem and the phloem so these are the two main vascular systems in a plant right so xylem is responsible for the transportation of water right water along with the nutrients the minerals uh, so mainly uh, it's a one-way transportation. So usually these things will be absorbed by the root system from the growing medium and then it will be transported to the top of the plant. Right? It's a one-way transportation. There's no uh, top-to-down transportation in xylem. Uh, but when it comes to phloem, it can be considered as a two-way transportation. Right? So... Phloem is responsible for the transportation of the photosynthates produced by the plants. We call them photosynthates because it's the end result of photosynthesis, right? So, end result of photosynthesis will be actually glucose and uh, when it comes to the transportation, it will be converted into sucrose, right? So, this photosynthesis will be mainly happening in leaves and then uh, this produced the product of glucose will be converted into sucrose and then it will be transported 
throughout the body of the plant. So we call it uh, the actual thing that is happening in phloem as the source sink relationship, right? So source means uh, Some instances, it, it may be some They're having a, a good relationship. If not, a plant cannot function. So, this phloem, right? So, in this case, this phloem is responsible to uh, transport. Sucrose, right? Sucrose will be transported throughout the body uh, through the phloem. So, their feeding material, they like to have this transporting sucrose as their feed, right? So, the, that, that is how we identify their feeding material. So, that is why they used to uh, hang on on this uh, stem part of the rice plant. So then they uh, they have, I think you have studied about their mouth parts, right? So the, these are, we call sucking insects. They suck the cell sap, right? So they suck the phloem sucrose, the so-called uh, chemical that is uh, transported is sucrose. So these, these mouth parts of this brown plant hopper, so these are adults actually. So these are adults. And they are having a kind of an incomplete life cycle. They are having eggs, nymphs, and adults. Right? Nymphs are almost similar for adults, but the body size will be lesser than the adults. But both of these stages, nymphs and adults, will do the damage because I think you can identify that uh, eggs. Usually cannot do a harm. Right? They are immobile, but nymphs and adults are mobile stages. They can move everywhere. They can move anywhere. So they can uh, exchange to from uh, one plant to another and do the harm. So usually these eggs are not considered as a harming stage, right? Uh, but these nymphs and adults, and sometimes in complete life cycle, you will find. There's another life stage called uh, the larvae, right? Larvae, in incomplete one, uh, the eggs uh, will turn into larvae and then pupae and then the adult. So mostly this larval, pupal and the adult stages will do the harm, right? So these are phloem feeders. So they like to have this uh, the so-called transported chemical throughout the phloem as their feeding material. And leaves, if they, if they do their harm, what happens? Leaves dry and turn brown. So they suck the cell sap from the uh, phloem. And because of that, unsported uh, their damage will do some harm for the leaves because uh, in some instances the uh, this xylem will also get damaged and uh, the water transportation throughout the body will be uh, much problematic because of the harm and uh, as they are doing much harm at the stem stage so the leaves are affected badly uh, by their attack, right? So then leaves try to turn brown. And in heavy infestation, so having these are uh, in little amounts will not do the harm, but they can have a kind of a higher percentage of uh, speed in breeding, right? They breed themselves very fast. So these insects are breeding very fast. So they can. 
their life cycle is also very limited so they are not living much time but at the same time they will do breeding so because of that their next generation will produce very fast so that will eventually happen and it is really difficult to catch one by one and because of that in a very limited time they will increase their population so it will lead to a heavy infestation and it is called a hopper burn right hopper burn uh, is something that we can identify in a uh, paddy cultivation very easily right so at the same time uh, as they are sucking insects uh, they are considered as vectors right vectors means so they can transport a kind of a it it it, it is saying that uh, they have the ab ability to have some uh, connection with diseases right they can transmit diseases from one plant to another so they do not know that uh, when the plant is disease or not they will ultimately uh, catch up with the kind of a stem and they will try to feed on it right so if a plant is diseased if a plant is diseased so the diseased materials the microorganisms are everywhere in the plant body so then once they have uh, fed on such kind of a disease plant so their mouth parts will eventually get the disease right so after that after some time they will uh, move to another maybe a healthy plant so that then this uh, microbes microorganisms in their mouth parts will transfer into the healthy plant so that is how they will act as vectors so especially viral diseases are mainly transmitted by this brown plant hopper so at the same time they will do another damage so one damage is they are uh, as a phloem feeder and then they can act as a vector for viral diseases in the second instance so most sensitive to attack in late vegetative and reproductive stage so i think you know about the plant uh, growth cycle so mainly there will be firstly the vegetative phase and then the reproductive phase right so every plant need to pass the vegetative phase phase to enter into the reproductive stage so when it comes to the rice plant so in the late vegetative stage right it is getting ready to enter into the reproductive stage so we are expecting they are uh, actually the fruit right we we call them seeds but actually it is the fruit and uh, uh, in botanical sense it will produce this uh, the specific seed right we we get the use of this seed as rice and uh, the paddy grains right so these are paddy grains so for that we need flowering and then the fruiting fruiting stage so in the late vegetative stage it is getting ready much uh, having all the uh, parts body parts of the plant repaired and if there are any uh, diseased or damaged part all get uh, repaired and then it will enter into the reproductive stage so reproductive stage starts with flowering and then it will uh, after pollination after the successful pollination it will produce the fruit right Fru fruit seen a kind of a inflorescence so it is having an inflorescence so this will produce the uh, next fruit as the seed so in this stage uh, the so called sucrose transportation throughout the body is very fast and it is in a very good state not like in other uh, growth stages of the rice plant so effective and efficient production of sucrose uh, especially the glucose and their translocation we call phloem translocation so that is very efficient and effective at this late vegetative and the reproductive stage so thereby as the uh, this brown plant hopper is much attracted towards this uh, 
sucrose, the phloem uh, transportation. So they are much like to have this growth stage as their feeding stage. Right? So if you have a cultivation, you must and you need to be in a, a very good monitoring stage uh, when your crop cultivation comes to the late vegetative and the reproductive stage because that is the most sensitive stage of the rice plant to get attacked by brown plant hopper. Right? And uh, when it comes to uh, their control, uh, one of the most important controlling mechanisms uh, for these pests, not for only this brown plant hopper, for almost all pests, is getting uh, these resistant varieties, right? Specific resistant varieties have been developed uh, for different pest types, and uh, we have identified a uh, few resistant varieties of rice for brown plant hopper. So, one of the uh, high resistant varieties is PTB33. So, this is not a Sri Lankan variety, this is Indian variety, right? Uh, but, however, this is considered as one of the highest resistant variety for brown plant hopper. And in uh, Sri Lankan context, the uh, produced varieties from Sri Lanka, so this moderate level resistance have been found in these. Uh, varieties of uh, paddy. So these are produced from uh, the Bathalagoda Rice Research Institute. That is why we call them BG, right? The specific rice research station uh, will be denoted by the English letters, uh, which is denoted prior to the number, right? So this BG3792, 300, 403, 304. 357, 358, and 360. So these varieties have shown moderate level of resistance to this brown plant hopper. So it means that they are uh, morphologically, in structural sense, they are uh, very hard uh, for them to attack. Right? In the phloem, uh, maybe it is much thick. Likewise, they have different characteristics in their plant parts. So it uh, gives some uh, more resistance for the brown plant hopper to get attacked. Right? So this is one such major uh, controlling mechanism of uh, pests and uh, these are the photographs of this the brown plant hopper attack. So this is known as the hopper burn. Right? This is known as the hopper burn. So this will be uh, arise when you do not have a proper monitoring mechanism, right? However, if there is a paddy cultivation, if you see this sort of uh, maybe a kind of a symptom when you look at your crop cultivation, so this may show you a higher infestation. It is not a very little one. This, this will be shown in very higher infestations only. Right? So these are affected paddy fields. You only see these sort of uh, scenarios if you do not have a proper mechanism to look after your crop cultivation. So in some areas of the country, there have been this kind of uh, situations. Maybe you do not have the uh, capacity to control it even. Right? So their breeding speed is very high. They will in, in very little time, they will increase their population. So this is how it seems if there is a higher infestation and this is called hopper burn. I think it was clear for you, the brown plant hopper. And we need to identify uh, the morphologically how we can identify them. These are just brown color ones, brown color. Uh, we can identify easily them uh, by how they are feeding on the uh, cropping system and their morphology, right? Brown plant hopper. So then we will come to the other control methods. So the use of resistant varieties will be the, I think, the most best 
controlling method for any kind of a pest attack because it will naturally give the resistant uh, nature for the plant to get attack from getting attacked from the so called pest so for this one we have resistant varieties as we have discussed and we have we can go for one of those right and the other one is flooding the fields so we have many other control methods maybe other farmers will directly go into the use of uh, insecticides but it is the last option that we can go for and as agriculturists we do not um, encourage the use of insecticides in the first sense right in the first hand we do not recognize that as a good way to control a pest especially an insect pest so we can go for the resistant varieties first and even we have used resistant varieties sometimes maybe uh, we can get the incidence of this pest so in that sense we can go for other cultural practices physical practices uh, to get uh, away from these conditions so flooding the fields so we can flood the field flood means we will increase the level of water in the field right so how this can be used as a control method anybody anyone having the idea how we can uh, control this one from increasing the level of water in the paddy field so as you have seen so these pests right nymphs and the adults so they are feeding on the stem part right stem portion of the plant and we can increase the level of water uh, up to a very high level so then it is really hard for them to uh, attach to the stem part while they are submerged in water right so if you flood the field in a very high level so it will be really difficult for them to what respirate right for the respiration they require oxygen but uh, when you when you flood with water it is really hard for them to respirate yes low oxygen in water so these insect types are not um, adapted to respirate oxygen from water so they need oxygen from air as we right but uh, when you flood the uh, stem portion when you flood the a specific paddy cultivation in a very high level it is very difficult for them to even get attached to the stem for a long time and then however they will at some point die right so then we can increase the level of water in the field we call it flooding right flooding the fields so if you increase the level of water at the later vegetative and the reproductive stage so that will be something important and the other one light traps so i think you have heard about light traps so they are uh, much attracted to light right we need to identify their behaviors so these are these adults and nymphs are much attracted to the light so we can have light traps especially in the night time so they are attracted to the light and we can make a kind of a trap so trap is a kind of a mechanism that we uh, allow them to enter into the specific trap but they do not have the ability to go away from the trap it is called a trap so we will uh, display a kind of a light and allow them to get attracted towards the trap and then after they have uh, come in to the trap they will not be able to go away again right so this is called a trap yes so another uh, idea uh, so worn with this be uh, lead into the rotting of paddy so this will be actually 
a kind of an intermittent flooding. So we cannot make the flooding for a long time. So it will actually do some harm. So in, in some instances, we have in paddy cultivation, the practices of flooding. We can increase the level of uh, water in the paddy field, but it is intermittent. Intermittent means uh, you raise the level and again you will drain it out and again it will be rising and again you will drain it out. Right? It is not for a longer time. You need to do it intermittent way. Right? And uh, regular monitoring. It is one such important thing. You need to go through your cultivation and look for any kind of an incidence of pest. It is called regular monitoring. Not just for the pest. Diseases for as well. So this regular monitoring is important. So if you do not monitor the cultivation, you don't identify any presence of them or symptoms of any disease or damage. So because of that, we need to have daily regular monitoring practices. That is how we identify their presence and damage. And even uh, you do all these actions and you don't find the result, we need to go for other ways. So the because before the use of insecticides, we can go for predators as well, but uh, it is called biological control, uh, the use of predators. So spiders, spider uh, species have been found that they feed on this brown plant hopper. So if you let these spiders uh, go throughout your cultivation, they will find the exact their feeding material, the brown plant hopper, and they will feed on them. So then uh, there will be eventually control of this uh, brown plant hopper. But uh, the specific, the disadvantage or, or the more major drawback is that these predators are much high in price. So some companies are there, they do breeding of these predators and they collect them. And once they uh, get some orders from uh, growers to have some, so they will. Uh, sell them, right? So we need some more capital to get those spiders or predators as a biological control method. So this is not just the spiders as we see in our homes. So these are different types, uh, spider types. Uh, so if you have the capacity to get the use of these ones, that will be known as a biological control. So if all these are going in vain, we need to go for the insecticides. Uh, so it is used only when and where essential. Right? So that is the last stage actually. Uh, so, so this book professing, so this is a kind of a chemical. So we can apply according to the recommendation that it says. Uh, and you need to identify the amount of crop cultivation you are having, the acres or the hectares. So it depends and uh, we can go for the insecticide, the specified insecticides to control their population, right? So that is how we can control BPH, brown plant hopper. So hope it was clear for you. And uh, we have another one, another major pest, yellow stem borer. Scopophaga insertulus. So, this is the scientific name. So, this yellow stem borer. So, it is a kind of a, we, from the name itself, it is saying it's a borer. Right? Borer means it bore into a, some sort of a part. Right? So, this is actually a kind of a uh, fly. And at the same time, it's, I think, uh, you have heard about and you have studied about the odors, right? And uh, actually, the brown plant hopper we have studied, it's a hemipteran, right? Hemiptera order will be there for the BPH. And yellow stem borer is a kind of a, uh, we call it a kind of a moth, right? So, to which orders these moths and other sort of ones are belong to, if you can remember. Maybe you have heard about Lepidopterans, Lepidop order Lepidoptera. 
So these are belongs to this order Lepidoptera, and uh, this is a kind of a moth. And also the butterflies are also coming under this order. So this is having a complete life cycle, right? A complete life cycle is there in yellow stem borer, and uh, because of that they uh, usually start with eggs, and then it uh, comes to a larval stage, the larvae, right? Larvae, and then it will uh, turn into a pupae and to an adult. So actually this larval stage, right? Larval stage is a kind of a worm-like structure is there. And uh, in yellow stem border, this stage is a kind of a caterpillar, right? So if you see caterpillars, so these are the larval stage. Actually, it's a kind of a very prominent larval stage that we can see. So if not, the other larval stages uh, are uh, seen as a worm, right? And a caterpillar bore into rice stem and it makes the rice stem hollow out, right? So this is a caterpillar. So I think you all have seen caterpillars, right? Caterpillars bore into the rice stem. So it's a borer, right? The name itself, it's a, it says a borer. Borer means it will uh, eat the things inside the uh, a kind of a stem part, a kind of a structure. And make it hollow. That is the thing that the borer do. Right? So, uh, they will, these caterpillars bore into the rice stem and make it a more hollow thing because it, it's not actually filled with something, but they will eat everything that they come across when they bore into the stem from top to bottom. So, they attack both young plants and all, all the plants, both types. And especially we, uh, I, we have identified the damage in two different ways. So if they attack the young plants, it will produce, we call dead heart, right? Dead heart. And if they attack the older plants, we call, uh, it produce white heads, right? White heads. So we will see, uh, so what, what, what type of things are they? And uh, because of this boring into the rice stem, it makes the uh, plant vigor go down, right? So there will be the hollow stem parts in the middle. And because of that, there will be no vigor strength to uh, in the upright position of the plant. So because of that, they break and uh, they become lodged. So often plants break and they become lodged. And uh, in serious outbreaks, so serious outbreaks are not much prominent, like in BPH. So no any serious outbreaks are found still, and it is very rare, right? So this is the uh, adult of this Lepidoptera it's a moth, right? So when they land on a surface, they are two wings. So they have two wings. So these two wings are uh, much flattened. When they are uh, on a kind of a surface landed on, right? So this is how the yellow stem borer is seen. Uh, a yellow color is there, and as their action is the boring into the stem, they are known as yellow stem borer. So if you see at the middle, so as they are boring into the, so they are. This uh, adult stage is not much problematic, right? The specific harm will, will be done by the caterpillar stage. It means the larval stage, right? So when they breed, their uh, eggs are there in the, uh, on, on top of these leaves. And then they will be uh, converted into the larvae. And then these larvae, the, or the caterpillars, will go into the middle section of the stem. So because of that, if you look at the uh, right top picture, the dead heart, right? The middle portion of the plant will be converted into the brown or yellow color. So it, it says that the lower portion, the bottom portions of the plant of the middle section is much uh, damaged. Because of that, the water or the transportation of water nutrients and also the transportation, translocation of this 
uh, photosynthesis will be damaged, will be problematic. So then it will be lead into a kind of a uh, much dry condition of the middle part. We call it dead heart because the heart means the middle. Right? Middle portion is dead. That is the meaning of dead heart. Right? Middle portion is much uh, susceptible for this uh, dead heart condition. Uh, not like the surrounding outer parts. So they go into the stem part in the middle. Right? So that is how the dead heart is seen when you look at the plant. And in the middle section is uh, like this. So you can identify that there may be the damage of uh, yellow stem borer. And uh, right bottom picture, it will uh, show you the white head. So white head means, so we call these uh, sections are panicles, right? Panicles. So these paddy or rice panicles will form the grains. So if you look at uh, in some plants, in, in a kind of a crop cultivation, some parts are seen as in white color, not uh, like in other uh, the golden color or green color of the panicles. So in some plants, these panicles are seen in white color, right? So this whole portion is in white color and the grains are not filled. And uh, this is actually a weak part of the body of the plant, right? As they are seen in white color, it is called as white. And uh, when it comes to it uh, emergence, that is why it's uh, called as a head, right? So the, the the most economically important part of the rice plant is the panicle, right? So because of that, the head head means the panicle, right? White color panicles can be seen in the older plants. So in younger plant, it is really easy for them to have the dead heart condition, and uh, in in older plants, older plants means these plants have entered into the reproductive stage now from the vegetative phase and because of that they have entered into the reproductive phase and formed already the panicles but these panicles are not like the proper panicles they are white in color and uh, less chlorophylls less green color and the grains have not been filled so these two symptoms can be identified to identify or detect the yellow stem borers attack right uh, so this is another picture of this uh, white heads right so this is how it seems the whole panicle is white in color and uh, the grains are not filled so again the, for the controlling methods we can go for the resistant varieties uh, but Actually, at this point, uh, still no any resistant variety have been found, right? Uh, as because of the attack or the outbreak is not serious, it is not much important, I think, to find a resistant variety. We can identify the attack and easily control that, not like in BPH. And uh, here, uh, as we have discussed for the BPH for flooding, the totally opposite activity should be done for the controlling method for yellow stem borer. So what is it? Draining water out of the field. Right? So what is the reason for this one? So in some cases we call, we, we used to have flooded conditions and some instances we need to drain the water out of the field. Can anybody explain how this is happening? So the thing is, uh, so this adult, adult fly will lay eggs in the uh, the surface of the leaves, right? Maybe uh, in, in the leaf section, they will lay their eggs. So after that, what happens This uh, when the time the uh, hatching is coming, right? Hatching of eggs, we call the egg hatching. So the larvae will come out of eggs. So what happens? Uh, so after they have come out of the egg, they used to have a kind of a 
uh, rolling mechanism around their body of the uh, this this laid area or the plant uh, leaf will be rolled surrounding their body so then they cut the part of the leaf and then they will have a kind of a roll like structure surrounding their body so this is done by the larvae right so this larvae will then what happens they will cut the part of the leaf and then they detach from the leaf and however they will fall onto the ground but what happens if if you are having water in the ground they will drop into the water column on the surface of the water and then because of the water currents they are moving into another plant right so water currents will be there so water will be a medium of transportation so once they are uh, fall onto the stream of water the column the surface and they will easily uh, transported to another plant right so that is how they transport uh, to another plant from one one to another so if you drain out of the rain, rain water out of the field they will not have that medium they will fall onto the ground so then they they will not have the ability to move towards the another healthy especially healthy plant right because they need much energy if they need to walk on the ground right so the larval stage is not having much energy and then what happens when they reach to another plant part so they will uh, again climb onto the top of the plant and then go into the stem right and then they uh, eat whatever they meet in the phloem or this the stem part in the middle and they go into the stem from top to bottom so that is how the uh, dead heart and the uh, specific we have talked about white head so these two conditions are happening if they attack to a plant right so to reduce that one we need to uh, have waterless or drained water in the field right so it is really hard for them to walk to another uh, plant because they are having less energy so the larvae needs more energy that is why they used to go into the stem and eat whatever they meet right they need energy and then fallowing fallowing means what have you heard about fallowing fallowing is another main control method for uh, yellow stem borer what is fallowing so in fallowing we do a, it's a kind of a, a culture practices in crop cultivation so after you have done a crop cultivation of rice in the same field uh, after the harvesting you need to keep that field uh, rice plant free for a limited time right so you should not start uh, another cultivation after harvesting without a gap time right you need to keep that area uh, as it is for a, a certain amount of time and then you can start the cultivation again it is called fallowing right what happens in fallowing so if there are any plants any any plants that are affected by the yellow stem borer in this season uh, after you have harvested they do not have the uh, feeding material right they do not have the feeding material any more in the ground and then they will have to die so after some time you can introduce another cultivation so you don't find their presence again so you need to give some uh, some amount of certain time to get away from the available amount of yellow stem borer uh, especially the larval stage right so that is called fallowing so other than that effective insecticides we have discussed about insecticide usage for bph also 
So this insecticide, so this, these are very common, fipronil, carbosulfan, and pentoid. So these are uh, much uh, effective towards this controlling of this larvae of the yellow stem borer. This is how you should control the yellow stem borer. So actually, the you need to identify uh, whatever the pest is, the damaging stages. So here the damaging stage will be the larvae. Right? So you need to control the larvae. Uh, but at the same time, if there are any other life stage is present uh, in your cultivation, so it may lead to another uh, population, increasement of the population. Then we have another one, right? Rice leaf folders, right? Rice leaf folder, right? So these these are a kind of a, again uh, a lepidopteran, and the damaging stage of life rice leaf folder will be a caterpillar. Again, it is having a complete life cycle. Uh, it's a verb-like structure, and um, caterpillars. Are doing the harm for the cultivation. So rice leaf folder. So name itself says that the rice leaf is going to be folded, right? So these caterpillars, they infest leaves, right? They feed on the mesophyll. So mesophyll layer. So it's a kind of a layer that is present in leaves, right? Mesophyll layer. So these mesophyll are uh, a kind of uh, a cell layer, a tissue, they are mainly responsible for the production of this photosynthesis. Right? They can do photosynthesis very effectively. Mesophyll cell layer of the uh, leaf. Right? So they are having number of uh, chlorophylls, chloroplasts in the cell and then they can effectively do the photosynthesis. So these caterpillars, they feed, they like to feed on the mesophyll cell layer of the leaves. Right? That is why these rice leaf folders are attacking the leaf section. So we need to identify whatever, when you are studying about pests, you need to identify the specific crop part that they do the harm. Right? So in this case, they will attack the leaves. So we need to protect the leaf section of the rice plant from rice leaf folders. So what they do is that they fasten edges of a leaf together. Right? Once they have landed onto a, a leaf, the caterpillars, the larval stage. Right? So caterpillars are the larval stage. So they uh, land on a leaf and once they have reached to a leaf, they used to fasten edges of a leaf together. So fastening means they are making it as a roll towards uh, surrounding their body, right? And then the edges of the leaves will be uh, fastened together by a kind of a secretion of this larvae. They secrete some, some amount of a, some, some kind of a chemical and they use that chemical to fasten the two edges. And feeding reduces productive leaf area. So what they do is that, so inside of this leaf, they are, there are caterpillars and then they feed on the mesophyll cell layer of the leaf. Right? So the most of the chlorophylls will be absorbed by these mouth parts. So then the, uh, the presence of these uh, chlorophylls will be very less in plant leaves. So then it may lead to uh, the less amount of photosynthesis of the leaves. And the productive leaf area, by that the productive leaf area will get reduced because they feed on the mesophyll cell layer. So, uh, according to the research, uh, they have found that they are, this rice leaf folders presence and their attack has been promoted by uh, many environmental conditions. Right? So, this can be triggered or induced by uh, proper or very very favorable climatic conditions, environmental conditions for rice leaf folder. So if you go through the conditions, cloudy and humid weather, 
right? So if if they do not uh, receive enough sunlight and uh, less humidity, right? Uh, so it will be a kind of an environmental condition that is favorable for rice leaf fall. So cloudy and humid weather, right? So it, it, it these conditions increase the presence of this rice leaf fall. So if, we, if, if the cultivation receives much sunlight, uh, that will not be creating much good environment for them to have good population. And shady locations, these cloudy conditions also provide this shadiness, right? Shady locations may be under a tree, right? If the rice plant, the rice cultivation is maintained under a very high and a very large tree, so it will be a, a sign that these rice leaf holders may be getting uh, in to the cultivation. So the shadiness is not good for uh, rice cultivation. And high nitrogen fertilizer. So what happens if you provide high amount of nitrogen fertilizer? So this uh, grower, so the farmers used to uh, provide more nitrogen for the plants. So it, it's a kind of a practice that many farmers do for many crops, not just for the rice crop. For many cultivations, growers, you, usually they like to provide high amount of nitrogen. Why is that? What is the reason? Any importance in that? Why, why farmers would like to provide more nitrogen? Grow fast, uh, Can you repeat your answer, please? Grow fast, Ah, uh, Yes, it, it, it grows fast, yes. It grows fast and at the same time, the greenery appearance will be very high. The greeniness. Right? The greenness will be very high. Because nitrogen is required for the production of actually the chlorophylls. So it will give more green appearance, right? So green, when it goes high, it will lead to the higher amount of photosynthesis. That is the hypothesis or the idea that the farmers are having. But at the same time, of course, it will lead to that level. But almost all these plants are having their maximum capacity of producing chlorophylls and chloroplasts for the photosynthesis for the photosynthesis because that there should be a kind of a maximum level so it will not be uh, getting very high when you apply nitrogen in very high level right at some point it will be not level so we we will get recommendations from the uh, department of agriculture if you consider about sri lankan context so we we get recommendations for basal and top dressings right basal dressing means you will apply it apply the specific uh, combination of fertilizers at the time of establishment but dressings may be one or several top dressings may be having so they are applied once the crop is established. So the amount of nitrogen uh, also they are recommending in different levels. So if you exceed the amount, if you exceed the amount, what happens? Of course, it will give more greener, greener day appearance, but it will attract more pests at the same time. Right? Because the pest sends that it is having more uh, more healthy nature right they, they they like to have healthy plants to feed on so high nitrogen fertilizers will give rise to more amount of these uh, chlorophylls chloroplasts and then the photosynthesis will be very high so the leaf section especially the leaf section will be growing very nicely so when the leaf section is very nice so these rice leaf holders are very much attracted towards the leaf. So that is why high doses of nitrogen fertilizers are not recommended. It does not just increase the photosynthesis, 
but at the same time it will attract more pests right so these are the conditions that will promote their incidence so this is the uh, a b c you can see here a means the adult so it is a kind of a moth again so that is why they are belonging to this order lepidoptera and b shows you the larvae the caterpillar right it, it is like a worm and uh, at the same time i think you can see how they are fastening the edges the two edges of the leaves so it's it's like threads right white color thread like structure it is secreted by the body of this larvae right so they try to fasten these two edges and to be inside of the uh, the roll like structure right so c in in c graph you will see what happens uh, when they have attacked the leaves so they uh, again suck the cell sap or, or they eat they feed on this mesophyll cell layer and because of this uh, uh, removal of the mesophyll cell layer the so called damaged area will be seen in white color because this mesophyll cell layer is having the most amount of chloroplasts right so most amount of chloroplasts will be occupied by this mesophyll cell layer so once they are absent what happens the green color portion vanish right so green color portion it vanished and uh, it is seen like in what or silver color maybe silvery color or white color right so that is how we can identify the rice leaf folders attack so this is how it seems once the uh, the fastening edges have been uh, removed so is it clear i think you all can identify that so this is how the damage seems right i think if you have a crop cultivation you can easily identify this attack uh then control methods for the rice leaf for the field sanitation is important so whatever uh, the pest attack right whatever the pest attack we need to have the field sanitation very well because this uh, unwanted plant parts and any other residues that we do not want in our cultivation should not be in the cultivation because sometimes it may be acting as a breeding place for this uh, pests right breeding places and sometimes they are resting places so field sanitation especially the plant parts that are infested with any type of a pest right so usually we we uh, in in very minor infestations we used to remove the plant parts that are infested by the pest so these parts should not be there in the crop cultivation they should be kept away right they should be especially should be uh, removed from the crop cultivation and recommended plant spacing right recommended plant spacing is important so most of the uh, paddy cultivations if you take a look at the paddy cultivation types uh, in some cases maybe you have seen uh, so it's a kind of a cultivation starts with seed paddy right seed paddy so it will be the planting material of uh, paddy cultivation or the rice cultivation so when it comes to seed paddy how we are going to Uh, have this establishment in some cases some farmers do broadcasting right broadcasting means you are just spraying spreading all the uh, seeds the the especially these uh, germinating seeds right germinating seeds uh, to the field so there will be no any proper spacing and they fall on the ground and they will start growing that is how broadcasting happens and some cases you will maintain a kind of a nursery or maybe uh, in nursery trays or depot nurseries if not the parachute uh, method likewise there are different methods that we can maintain a nursery 
for the rice cultivation. So mainly if you maintain a nursery, then you can go for the transplanting. But in the case of this uh, rice plants, we need more rice plants to have more grains because the grain is a very uh, little body of little body part of the plant and we need more grains from one plant that is what uh, we expecting we are expecting from a rice plant right we need more grains from a plant and uh, one plant is not enough actually we need more plants in our field so then uh, transplantation we need much labor and if you get the use of machines it requires more power right so there are especially two ways that we can do the transplantation we can do we can get the use of manual power or we can transplant it plant uh, transplant these plants by our own hands right but it takes more time uh, but tractors or any other uh, appliances are there we can go uh, using machinery right and in machinery we can actually uh, maintain the plant spacing and if you go through the manual transplantation by ourselves the hand transplantation so you can uh, keep an eye to maintain the recommended plant spacing right so that is how usually these two kind of uh, kinds of these plantations are carried out broadcasting and transplantation so especially in broadcasting plant spacing will be not maintained right so that will be a kind of a uh, problem that you are having more amount of plants in a specific area of land so what happens so usually we think that uh, as much as we can in the per unit area of land we can get more yield but that is not the case because uh, when the plants are getting much closer than the recommended spacing what happens anything that we can expect uh, from that type of a scenario so plants are much closer to each other so they are lesser than the recommended plant spacing what happens so of course you will get more number of plants per unit area of the land but at the same time what you can expect any other thing you can expect plants can't get all the, all the factors sunlight mm, and yes the the growth factors so there will be actually a, a kind of a competition will be there a very higher competition between the plants for the crop growth factors i think you have studied about the crop growth factors right so there will be a very high competition uh, between the plants even though they are belonging to the same species they are not different plants but then uh, they are same plants same species in the uh, plant species but as they are different plants they are having a very great uh, competition between each other and at the same time uh, so we can expect this competition between both underground and the aerial environment right so the underground portion if you take a look at the underground portion the root system are uh, the root systems of the plants are very closer to each other maybe they are getting uh, attached to each other sometimes so that will be a kind of a, a very bad competition between the plants for the uptake of water and nutrients right so if you uh, it's a kind of a competition for the crop growth factors but at the same time that is a kind of a entry point for the pest attacks as well so how this can be happen when it comes to the crop growth that will be a, a kind of a bad condition the not maintaining the proper recommended plant spacing and at the same time it will be a kind of the same problem a kind of a problem will be created uh, by this condition for the pest attacks as well so the reason is that it is really easy for one pest 
to transport to another because it's are very close the plants are very close to each other so if one plant get attached uh, attached to another plant if one get attacked by a pest it will really easy to get attacked to another very close by right so likewise it will be surrounded by number of plants so all the plants uh, will get attacked by the pest which are surrounding by the infected one so it is really easy for the pest to get uh, increased in population and all the all the plants will show the symptoms like in hopper burn right so hopper burn is also kind of a that one we need to maintain the proper spacing right recommended plant spacing is important not just for allowing to uh, plants to get good crop growth factors but at the same time to have less amount of pest attacks so you need to uh, have the recommended plant spacing you should not increase the plant amount the amount of plants in the uh, given field area and recommended dose plus time of nitrogen fertilizer right we have discussed that uh, having more nitrogen than the recommended amount uh, will be a kind of a reason for increasement of this population of this rice leaf fold, right? So we have discussed why is that. So they are much attracted towards the uh, much healthy leaf section because of the nitrogen. And of course, at the same time, uh, not just the dose, at the same time, we need to identify the time as well. Time means this, not, this should not be applied in frequent manner. So there should be a kind of a interval, right? Intervals should be there in application of nitrogen because once you apply nitrogen once, then the next one should have a kind of a in between these two should have an interval. If not, what happens? Uh, the higher amount of nitrogen and at the same time higher frequency of applying nitrogen will lead to uh, more amount of healthy leaves and then uh, it will create the favorable condition for the rice leaf order to uh, attach to the leaves. And again, the regular monitoring. So as we have discussed for the others as well, regular monitoring is important so you can identify their attack. So we can identify their attack in the first sense, right? One or two may be there in the cultivation, so we can get some action. Again, following. Following is another uh, controlling method for many pests. So you should not start another cultivation after harvesting at once. Right? So you need to keep a gap time and then start the cultivation uh, after some time. So then in this gap time, this uh, insect will not find. Uh, they are feeding material in the field. So because of that, they will have to die. So when the adult die, there will be no any uh, eggs, laying of eggs. And however, we need to uh, damage one or several uh, growth stages of this pest to control them. So when the adult is controlled, all the other growth stages will be uh, damage so they will be not there and insecticides if these are if these control methods are not much effective we can go for insecticides right so these are the insecticide to bend in my mind so you so this this uh, chemical is much important in controlling this one and we have different concentrations as well uh, and also we need to the specific thing is that we need to identify the specific dosages and the concentrations not all types are uh, effective and uh, when it comes to the application we should apply them in the most minimum levels right you should not use higher concentrations and uh, not recommended levels of 
dosages. Then we have another one, rice gold meat. Right? So this is another uh, kind of a pest that we are having in rice cultivation. Rice gold meat. So here in this picture, you will see uh, how we can identify them. Uh, a little bit different to what we have dis discussed earlier. Um, so this is a kind of an adult, right? adult rice bowl midge. Uh, it's like a mosquito. Right? I think you all have seen mosquitoes. Uh, so this is a kind of a mosquito-like uh, pest. Right? We can identify their uh, morphological context. So then we can identify them uh, usually uh, in red, orange color. So they are landing on the plant. So like this. And then uh, adult is a mosquito like nocturnal. Right? Nocturnal means they are much activated in night time. Right? So female and the male are uh, in different colors. Right? Females are usually seen in red color and uh, males are in yellow color. Right? That is a difference. And uh, they are actually see, uh, said as seasonal pests. So they are not actually attracted in every time to a crop. They are seasonal. Right? At some points only they will be there in the uh, cultivation and they are also attracted to light right so that those are the things that have been found so we can easily trap them by the use of light traps so if you take a look at the time that they uh, usually do the damage to the crop cultivation so they are known as a kind of a crop, uh, the pest category that attack the crops, attack only to tillering stage. So do you know about tillering? Tillering, what is tillering? Especially we talked about uh, tillering in paddy. What is tillering? Have you heard about tillering? Tripping stage, Chakad. Uh, did you say about ripening? Ripe, ripening stage? Mm. Uh, no, no. It's it's not uh, the linked to the ripening. Ripening means, uh, so actually we do not expect any ripening stage. Uh, actually, we call, do not call as ripening. But... Uh, <laughs> Yes, can you repeat your answer? I didn't hear you. Kirivadina Vastavad? No, no. Kirivadina Vastavad? No, no. Tillering. Tillering, you know, Panduruga, you know, Panduruga, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, rice plant, you know, you know, grass family, grass, you know, you know, you know, you know, grass, you know, 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 Rice plant take it in a me pandura pidia had in a ne panduruga negatama began tillering here. Right? So, as they are uh, actually uh, like uh, this, uh, this pest is like a mosquito, these are belongs to the family, uh, so the order diptera. Right? Mangitano will ahala the diptera in a family, uh, sorry, order. Uh, so they are mainly the mosquitoes. Mainly the mosquitoes will come under diptera, order diptera. Uh, so this one, so this uh, specific uh, pest category will attack only to tillering stage as we have discussed. Right? Tillering means uh, there are different tillering stages actually. There is not only ones. Right? There are different tillering stages in rice cultivation, so they will attack to this tillering stage. 
So severity depends uh, crop growth and the stage of attack, right? How much severity is there? Uh, it 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 uh, depends on how severe it severe their damage is and the stage of attack, right? So tillering takes in different times, right? It is not happens uh, overnight, and there are different stages in tillering, right? So each of these tillering stages will be having their susceptible moments for getting attacked by the rice bowl niche. Right? Uh, so, larvae reach the apical lateral bud. So, here these dipterans are having a complete life cycle again. Right? So, in uh, complete life cycle, we have eggs, larvae, or the pupae, and the adult. So, then what happens? This larvae is doing the uh, actually, the harm larvae, it's a kind of a worm like structure, a caterpillar like structure. So, they reach the apical lateral buds. So, bud portion is in the mi very middle of the plant. Uh, so, if there are many tillers, so each one of these tillers are also having the bud in the middle. Right? So, this bud will be the most immature part, and then they are, uh, the area is much activated. And produce new leaves, new leaves, and sometimes it gives rise to the panicles. Right? That is a, a kind of a region called bud. Right? So this apical, the most uh, top portion, the apex of the plant is known as the apical uh, bud. Right? The main mother plant will be there in the middle, and uh, surrounding that mother plant, we will be having more tillers. So, these tillers and the mother plant, almost all these are actually producing panicles. That is why we, we get more panicles from a, a rice plant. So, there will be not only one panicle, there will be number of panicles. So, these panicles will be produced by each of these tillers. Okay. So, this larvae, what they do is that they reach the most upper portion of the bud. And they lacerate tissues until pupation. What happens next is that they lacerate tissues. They they eat them, right? Lacerate. So they eat they tear these tissues and eat everything until it gets pupation. So in pupation, the pupal stage is a kind of a immobile stage, right? Pupae. Pupal stage. Right? This stage is immobile. They cannot move in that stage. But one, once they get uh, come to that pupal stage, uh, the harm that they are doing is will be temporarily stopped. So until they reach the pupation, they will lacerate the tissues. Because uh, I have mentioned that the pupal stage is immobile. So, in immobile stage, they do not have the capacity to move here and there to eat, right? So, what they do is that they eat as much as they can in their larval stage and gather energy. And then this energy will be preserved in their pupal stage until it comes to the adult stage. That is what happens in insect life cycles, right? So, this... Uh, in the pupation, it is immobile, but it is having the uh, the required amount of energy within them because they have eaten much in their larval stage, right? So, what happens? Uh, they have come to the pupation. It lead to goals. Goal means a kind of a a bowl like structure. Uh, we call them silver or onion shoots. We'll see how it forms. Onion shoot formation, right? Onion shoots, if not silver shoots, right? It's a goal, goal, a kind of a blockage uh, that is uh, maintained by this uh, uh, pupation. So it blocks something and form silver or onion shoots. The shoot portion will be white or gray or silver in color, 
and it seems like an onion shoot, onion uh, leaf, right? And goals terminate till the development affect rice yield. What happens there is that uh, this goal, the specific goal-like structure they produce, uh, we blocking the tiller de development, right? Blocking and at the same time, in heavy infestation, it will terminate or stop the tiller development. So tillers are important for rice yield, and this will directly harm on the uh, rice yield because it stops the tiller development. Again, uh, favorable conditions have been found for the damage. A uh, wet, humid weather. Uh, so this wet humid weather is not much uh, good for this one uh, rice gold which if you have this condition uh, you can expect there are infestations and uh, dry and intermediate zones in maha season and wet zone in yala season right so in maha season uh, now we are experiencing the maha season and we get more amount of rain especially than we expected uh, because of many climatic changes. Uh, however, the dry and intermediate zones will get more rains from Maha season, right? So that will create more wet conditions, wet weather for the dry and intermediate zones. And at the same time, the conditions will be same for wet zone in Yala season. Because in the Yala season, wet zone will get more rains, right? Uh, them, uh, comparably, the Yala season is getting low rains with Maha when compared to Maha. But uh, these zones, so Sri Lanka is uh, divided into two, three uh, climatic zones, dry, intermediate, and wet zones. And comparably, uh, these zones are getting uh, the rains in Yala and Maha in these amounts. So that is why. The wet conditions in these zones are different in different uh, seasons. So in these seasons, so we need to identify where the grower or the farmer is located in. And then we need to identify whether they are experiencing any wet, humid weathers. So that condition is not good for uh, successful cultivation. So... Maybe they are getting the infestation of rice gold niche. Uh, we can get some resistant varieties to get away from this condition. So PTB 18 and PTB 21. So these are Indian varieties. So these have been showing much resistivity. And uh, we have Batalagoda varieties as well. So these are uh, considered as resistant varieties. So if we can go to this type of resistant variety, so we can get rid of rice gold mitch attack very easily. And uh, natural enemies, so it is called biological control. We can get the use of natural enemies, so there are enemies for rice gold mitch. So Hymenoptera parasite, so Hymenoptera is a kind of another order. Uh, so this uh, Hymenopterans. The insects belong to the order Hymenoptera. They act, they act as a kind of a parasite. So what are parasites? Have you he heard about parasites? Paraposhitev. Oh, Paraposhitev gilapiki, you know. So they will uh, especially feed on their eggs. Right? So these Hymenopterans, so they feed on their eggs. So when the eggs are eaten by these Hymenopterans, what happens? One of the growth stages are damaged. So then uh, there will be no any larval stage or pupal stage. Again, no adults. Right? And Coleoptera. Coleoptera, who belongs to the order Coleoptera? So this is another very Be common. Yes, beetles. Very good. Right? Beetles. So they are coming under the order Coleoptera. Right? So these beetles, Coleopterans. So, they are also acting as predatory beetles. Right? Kurumino goda kaitibene, me coleoptera kri go trader. Coleoptera and predatory beetles slime. Right? So, these parasites and uh, predatory beetles. So, they have been found uh, 
uh, as enemies of rice bowl niche. So we can go for this one to control. So, so these are the onion shoot or the silver shoots I have described. So if you take a look at the uh, tillers, so here you will see tillers, right? Tiller, uh, how we can see it's a kind of a ओनेंदुरुंडो मदर प्लांट हिटेटिकुदूपाट हिर grass so there we can identify the presence of rice bowl which can be there and if you take a look at the right top picture so these pictures have been taken from the most uh, down part the most uh, down part of these tillers right so they make a goal so they make a goal that will block the uh, transportation of water and nutrients and also uh this translocation of phloem uh transportation so because of this bowl cell round color bowl like structure so they that will damage and they will uh, block the transportation of this uh water nutrients and phloem translocation so because of that uh the proper development proper color development and the functioning will be blocked in each Uh, tiller, because of that they will produce this white color uh, portions, white or grey color portions here and there in the uh, grass. So that will be a good sign that we can identify their attack. So control methods, we can go for the resistant varieties. That is the most important one, and uh, light traps again, as we have discussed earlier. this one also getting attracted towards the light and because of that we can maintain uh, a kind of light traps in night and of nitrogen is also important how you apply it right split nitrogen application it means uh let's say you need to apply 100 grams of nitrogen and you are going to add it once so that is not a good application right you can have it split into uh, several splits maybe 20 into 5 times right likewise 25 into 4 times likewise we can split the dosage split the dosage into different uh, applications split nitrogen application not once you are going to divide into several sections and you are in one application you are applying very little amount not the whole amount at once so this will also lead to uh, this uh, not having more nitrogen 
for the cultivation. So that will also act as a good application technique. But when it comes to the application of granular insecticides, their effective nature is very less because uh, that is acting as a kind of a, a granule. Because of the nature of this granule, it is not a liquid. So because of that, their spreading nature is very less. Right? So it is difficult to obtain good control with granules. Right, so we have another one, the last one, paddy bug. Right, paddy bug. So that is also uh, one such important uh, pest in uh, rice cultivations. So it's a bug, right? Paddy bug. So bugs, bugs. I I hope you all have heard about bugs. Right. So this is how it seems. Right. Uh, the adult will be there uh, on the top two uh, photographs. And the downmost picture will show you uh, the laid eggs. Right. Eggs that they have laid. So these paddy bugs, so this is how it seems in a uh, cultivation, how the attack seems. So their damage is a little bit different that we have discussed uh, for the other ones. In, in this type of a life cycle, both nymphs and adults, only the size and the function of their body will be different, but they look the same, right? Nymphs, uh, especially, they are in a great need of energy. Because of that, there will be a higher damage from nymphs, right? So, these nymphs and the, both the adults. So, we have the uh, damage from these two. Uh, types these two damaging uh, ages the crop uh, the growth stages and uh, this is also belong to the order hemiptera the the mosquito uh, order right so what they do is that they suck the developing grains causing empty partially filled grains so they are damaging especially the grain sections. So that will be considered as a kind of a very high damage because uh, until now we can get the uh, get more precautions to get our crop cultivation safe from other type of pests. But uh, the economically important part of the crop, the rice crop is the grains. We expect grains from the uh, rice plant. But the the most severe case here is that they actually directly influence, directly impact on the grains. So that is why they are heavily damaging our yield. Right? What they do is that they suck the developing grains. So developing grains are so this this development of grains is very important. Right? We, we need to give all the necessary facilities for the crop to provide us with the optimum amount of harvest. Right? So the harvest is coming from grains. Right? So especially the developing grain. That will have
sprouting grain stage is the targeted stage, the crop stage uh, for this buck, paddy buck. So, if they do much harm, what happens? These grains become empty because the filling material, the filling nature of this, uh, the, the all the uh, the specific photosynthesis, the filling material will be totally absorbed. It will be totally sucked by the paddy bug. So there will be nothing to uh, make it filled, and because of that, they will become empty. And sometimes they become partially filled. They are not fully filled grains. Sometimes they are empty or partially filled. So that is the case. And because of their uh, attack, they are not seen in the green color in the first stages and then it will not turn into the, uh, the golden color that we are expecting from the finely filled grains. It will not come to that color. So here you will see some uh, brownish uh, gray white color uh, parts or grains in the panicle. So these are the parts that are affected by the paddy bug. Right? So they are uh, abnormally seen from the outer appearance and uh, their infestation, their heavy infestation can reduce 3 to 5 percent rice yield in the country. Right? So there's greater probability of uh, lowering the yield by this paddy bug uh, because they are directly attacking the rice grain. And adults and mature nymphs. Right, so these are the uh, the damaging stages of the pest, and uh, they the the other main important thing is that uh, maybe we have talked about this following, but uh, we have another concern. So it is uh, as a principle, as a principle for any crop cultivation, we usually recommend not to have weedy conditions surrounding the crop cultivation. Why is that? Right. So weeds, especially the weeds should not be there actually in the field, uh, but at the same time surrounding the field. Because these swans, especially this paddy bug, uh, can survive in weed plants because they are acting as, as hosts. Right? They may be acting as they are, actually they, they are much like to have the feeding material from rice, but they can have the, the other weeds as their host places for especially these resting places, breeding places, right? In the absence of this uh, rice plant, they can even feed upon on these weed plants, right? We, we call them alternate weed hosts, right? So we should not let uh, the surrounding uh, area of the crop cultivation and also the specific crop cultivation awaited by uh, Weeds. So, natural enemies. We have natural enemies as well we, as we have discussed predators and egg parasitoids, right? Egg parasitoids. Uh, eggs. So, egg parasitoids especially means that the paras parasites, the parasitic nature will be on eggs, right? So, Grionixoni is a kind of egg parasitoid, very common and uh, very popular. Uh, but the thing is, they are much costly. We need to pay much to get their uh, presence in our field. And uh, because of this one, this, this kind of a drawback, mainly many of the growers do not get the advantage of natural enemies. Uh, but we can, as they are open environments, we can let them in our uh, of the field conditions uh, naturally without introduction uh, artificially and other control methods field sanitation is important you should not let anything that is not required in your cultivation be in your cultivation and uh, insecticides so we have different chemicals in different percentages we can use them in different uh, recommendations. According to recommendations only, we can go for the insecticides if there is a higher infestation only. Right? 
so we have talked about this one and that will make the end so i think we have discussed a uh, few major tests so that will give you some idea on how we should control them so uh, i will summarize it up so we need to especially identify uh, the so called pest actually uh, by good monitoring practices uh, better you need to if you can identify the so called specific pest type who is it, it right so you need some morphological uh, idea of identifying this pest uh, in the first sense and after that you need to have some idea uh, on what type of a life cycle it has right whether it is a complete life cycle or an incomplete life cycle then of course afterwards we can identify uh, in which growth stages of this pest we can uh, attack we, we can get the uh, attack for our crop cultivation and then we need to decide how to destroy the specific growth stage and what are the control methods so the, those are the things we discussed in this session so i'm happy if you have any uh, questions regarding this session if you need any clarification uh, so in the previous session we have uh, talked about the major pests of rice and uh, giving the most importance to the rice crop the paddy cultivation and next we have uh, another set of important pests that you will encounter if you have a cultivation uh, in a different crop category right the crop category will be different uh, but we are again talking about the same pests uh, so this crop category will be on uh, pests of fruits and vegetables recording in progress so the pests of uh, fruits and vegetables so i guess you all know and uh, when it comes to our consumption for the food uh, fruits and vegetables so these are a kind of a another important crop category uh, actually two categories right fruits and also the vegetables uh, which are important as plant based materials in our diet right so of course uh, uh, as humans we will uh, depend on many types of materials for our food uh, including plant based materials and uh, animal based materials uh, and maybe some people are there they are uh, totally depending on the plant based materials maybe vegetarians vegans and uh, uh, most of the population will depend on the both right so these fruits and vegetables both are crop based or the plant based materials and especially important in our day to day diet uh, of course uh, when it comes to the importance uh, we can get many importances actually from plant based materials than that we can expect from animal based uh, food right so many uh, type of chemicals maybe you have heard about antioxidants right antioxidants polyphenols carotenoids likewise many types of chemical compounds are there in fruits and vegetables Uh, that we cannot expect from any animal based material so as the animal based materials there may be some set of chemicals the, that we can uh, expect from those that we cannot expect from plant based materials so however uh, according to the findings uh, recommendations the best way is to incorporate both in our diet the plant based materials and the Uh, animal based materials because they have different types of capacities uh and both leads to our uh, proper functioning of our bodies as humans so as we are much targeted towards this uh, crop cultivations here today we will be talking about only the crop types and this is mainly because of food consumption so the rice important as a staple food for ourselves and uh, when it comes to the fruits and vegetables so uh, there is a great production 
in our country as a local production and at the same time i think you all uh, will agree with me that uh, many fruits and vegetables are even it's uh, imported to our country so uh, that is also not much self sufficient at the moment and uh, these are actually two different uh, crop categories fruit cultivation and the vegetable cultivation uh, these two actually some are imported and at the same time our production are exported to other countries as well so when it comes to production and import importation both are responsible for our uh, consumption because these are uh, much essential components in our diet right uh, maybe you have heard about food pyramid right in food pyramid the lowest the bottom part will be occupied by this fruits and vegetables and uh, uh, as a food as, as food categories these are important so crop cultivations are maintained for fruits and vegetables and these pests and diseases are eventually or they are inevitably taking place in our fruits and vegetable cultivations so that is why we need to identify the specific types of pests that will cause some damage because we do not expect any damage to our crop cultivation uh, but however uh, when it comes to especially the pest types they do some harm maybe it is not much economical if you uh, do monitor well and do some uh, effective controlling mechanisms but eventually it will do some damage so to minimize that damage we need to identify who are they and how they attack to our crop so then so uh, these two will be discussed in uh, separately so major pests of fruit crops we call fruit crops so we have uh, these food crops as main ones in our country banana mango citrus type uh, ones and pineapple and papaya so i will talk about these ones and uh, some are actually so those are not be discussed and uh, these ones so here i have given the most prominent or major pest types for each type of fruit crops so we'll see how they do the harm and who are they and uh, first one so this is uh, important and prominent in banana cultivations right banana pseudostem weevil right odoriferous longifolii so this is uh, very common this is the scientific name and here you will see the right side picture the specific adult so maybe you have heard about pest boxes right pest uh, boxes we we usually uh, make some uh, by preserving their specimens right to give an idea on what type of a pest is this so we usually make these pest boxes right uh, so the dyed uh, insect is they are pinned in a box right so this is how it uh, seems morphologically uh, so it's a weevil belongs to this uh, order coleoptera right uh, so banana pseudostem you mainly it will attack the banana plants and uh, pseudostem right banana pseudo stem weevil so the name itself gives the uh, specific type and to which type of crops it damage and the uh, nature of the plant part the pseudo stem means what what is the meaning of pseudo stem so when you look at the banana plant uh, we all have seen banana plants so what we can see from the green color portion is a pseudo stem it is not the actual the true stem of the plant right the actual true stem is a rhizome so it is under the underground area under the soil layer so that is the true stem actually but what we see as green color is there as the pseudo stem we call pseudo means false right pseudo means false it is a false a false stem Right, false stem. The meaning is false stem. Uh, it looks like a stem, but it is not, right? So that is for the uh, production of this photosynthesis or the photosynthesis. 
it is not actually the uh, stem part of the banana plant it is called a pseudo stem so these ones we will we will this banana pseudo stem we will will attack this pseudo stem part so larvae so this is having uh, four group stages right the eggs will be there and the larvae will come out from the eggs and then the pupal stage and the adult stage so uh, the main problem is coming from the larvae right larvae feed on internal tissues of pseudo stem and uh, the rhizome part as well uh, which are very uh, closer to the aerial parts right rhizome is uh, beneath the soil layer but uh, the most uh, closer area to the pseudo stem we be again uh, can be attacked by this banana pseudo stem we will other than that it does not go much deep right so however the aerial part aerial part of the banana plant will be attacked by the banana pseudo stem we will so what happens so they feed on the internal tissues right internal tissues of the banana plant maybe you have seen that inside of the banana plant so there are there is a high amount of tissues so these are the target areas for the larvae so they need energy so because of that they eat as much as they can so they damage the internal tissues and they eat them so because of that the tissues the functioning of the tissues are, are blocked damaged and the whole plant in a, in the heavy infestation what happens the whole growth will be retarded and the stem portion the the stem portion that we see in the plant will be weakened and sometimes it may collapsed it means lodging of the full plant maybe you have seen that in in uh, banana cultivations they become fully collapsed right maybe it is happening in, in a very short instance right it does not uh, take much time at once it will collapse so that is the idea that this has been uh, maybe we can suspect that this has been infested by banana pseudo stem weevil and uh, the growing point so each and every this banana plant is having a growing point in the middle right so if they pass through that growing point it may lead to the death of the full plant so that is the most uh serious damage it can do right so the, the, this is how it do the damage and uh, this is another one so like this one this is this banana pseudo stem weevil this is another one banana rhizome weevil right so name implies uh the damage to which part it do the damage banana rhizome weevil so it will attack the rhizome again it's a coleoptera the same scenario again the larvae is doing the much damage larvae feed on pseudo stem uh, and the rhizome especially below ground level so their target area is the rhizome right and also the pseudo stem parts which is close by to the rhizome will be targeted for the uh, banana rhizome we will so they feed on the pseudo stem and the rhizome uh, area of the underground portion the larvae uh, at the same time we call them grubs in, in weevils uh, the larval stage is also named as grubs if you if you look see that name in literature that that is also mentioning the larval stage so they are very uh, large in body size and they are much similar to worms right and tissue at uh, edge of tunnels uh, turn brown so if you take a look at the uh, leftmost picture it is more or less similar to the banana pseudo stem weevil but there's a difference actually they have differences to identify and in the middle you will see uh, how highly infested rhizome part is seen right so then uh, tissue tissues at the edge of the tunnel so they make tunnels in the inside of the uh, rhizomes and then they come out of the tunnel 
and uh, the areas where they have come out from the tunnels they become brown so this is how it seems in the rhizome part so if you uh, dig them out dig the rhizome part out you will see this type of a, a nature in the rhizome so this will give the uh, proof that this plant has been infested by banana rhizome weevil and again uh, if they do much harm it may lead to the death of the plant so to control so the control of both these ones banana pseudostem weevil and the banana rhizome weevil uh, usage of pest free planting material so when you select planting materials so what type of planting materials are taken for banana cultivations the planting material that we need to have to start a cultivation rhizome uh, yes rhizome can be taken other than that mainly we use another type of uh, planting material maybe you have seen some are transporting them uh, from one farmer to another or in sometimes the public transport system also some some are taken tissue cultured plant yeah, yes tissue cultured plants are also there for the banana cultivations we can use tissue paper, but it, it is costly but it takes more cost right uh, usually we will get the use of suckers right sucker maybe you have heard about suckers uh, other than the mother plant it will again uh, as we discussed in the rice cultivation it will produce more plants have you seen that in one mother plant there may be and other small plants are coming surrounding from the mother plant in banana they are called suckers right suckers so mainly there are three types of suckers and we recommend to have uh, be the most uh, demanded planting material for banana other than that we can go for this tissue culture and also for the uh, rhizome as well but for the rhizome we need to have some more time until it gives a uh, plant but if you start from a sucker uh, the small baby plant is there actually the very small plant is there and it will grow uh, the thing is that it will take lesser time compared to a rhizome to have a, a well grown plant that is why the uh, suckers are mostly accepted and uh, here when you select these suckers or rhizomes right yeah, especially in tissue culture plants we don't expect any uh, disease so they are disease free actually but uh, when it comes to the other parts dissemination of other parts for the establishment for the crop cultivations we need to get them pest free right you should not select any sucker or a rhizome uh, from a infected or infested plant right the plant uh, part that you are selecting should be pest free so if the, if if your planting material is uh, is infested by pest it will not they are laying eggs and the grubs will come out usually the, for these two the grubs form is very common and they are uh, larval stage actually so this larval stage right this eggs eggs are coming out and they uh, feed on the materials other than the, uh, this banana banana plant uh, in other uh, residues in the plantation or the cultivation right? so the sanitation should be very much important you should not allow any especially the pest infested plant parts in the cultivation and also any other type of unwanted materials in the 
seed because they can uh, sometimes they lay eggs on this debris or residues so you should not let any unwanted material in the cultivation um, then traps right so we can get the use of traps uh, usually these traps are made with uh, with or without pests, pesticides right so usually these uh, traps are used with pesticides so what we do as traps is that uh, we usually when it, when it, when it comes to um, a harvested banana plant we usually remove it remove the plant from the cultivation right so we can have some uh, middle sections middle parts of the plant uh, of the banana plant after it has been harvested and then we can keep it here and there so of course we recommend that you should uh, maintain the sanitation but this is a kind of a trap right so harvested plant parts can be uh, spread here and there in the cultivation. And what happens? This uh, weevils, both types, right? especially the uh, banana pseudostem weevil think that this is a good source to feed. So because of that, the uh, larvae, larvae will enter into these plant parts that are spreaded here and there. And that will make a good entry point because it is already open. So they, they will uh, feed on that material. So then we can easily trap them. And so mainly what happens is that these portions, these plant parts are treated with pesticides. So once they are feeding on that uh, plant part, at the same time they are uh, toxicated by this pesticide. So what happens? Uh, at the same time they are feeding, they will get died. Right? So that is how the traps are made uh, to catch, especially the uh, banana pseudostem weevil. And at the same time, we can do the same thing for the rhizomes as well to trap uh, banana rhizome weevil. Right? That is how the traps are uh, utilized uh, to catch these two types. And uh, insecticides, we can go for the insecticides, uh, the same as the pesticides. So these are uh, well recommended and what we need to do that is use the recommended amount only. Then uh, another specific one for this uh, fruit fly, uh, for the fruit crops, fruit fly. Uh, so maybe you have heard about fruit fly. Right, fruit fly is a very common one in fruit cultivations. Bactrocera dorsalis, so this is very common, and for many research activities, these have been targeted. And uh, so they are, as the name implies, they are attracted towards the fruits, and at the same time, they attack to fruits. Right, fruit fly. A fruit fly is uh, much attracted towards any sort of a fruit. Maybe it's a vegetable, but it's when it's ripening, it really attracts fruit flies. So, uh, so this is the adult, right? So it's a deterrent. So uh, the the mature adult is here, and however, we'll see how they are attacking the uh, fruits. So they are again, as we have uh, talked about these paddy bugs, right? Uh, so they are actually, these fruit flies are also attacking the specific economical part of the plant. So economical part, maybe the, the most important plant part for ourselves will be known as the economical important plant part. Right? So that will be uh, very serious. So if they are doing some damage to the uh, economically important plant part directly, it will be a serious problem. So this is also one such. So, result will be, what will be the end result? Immature fruit fall. Right? The fruit also will, fruit already getting fallen if you do not uh, harvest it. But this fruit is going to be fall down um, in the immature stage. So, that is something abnormal. I think you all can identify that. Immature fruit fall is something abnormal. So, that can be uh, expected by the uh, higher infestation of fruit fly. 
and deformed foot right deformed foots it means the form the specific shape it should carry is not there deformation okay? deformed foot ियन micro organisms as well right we call that type of uh, uh, if 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 after uh, the damage that it cause if it if the plant part is having another infection by a micro organism it is known as a secondary infection because that infection is due to the damage done by this fruit fly right it is not a a direct infection it is an indirect infection because of this fruit fly's damage right if there has no no any damage by the fruit fly there has there will be no any infection right because the reason why because the infection has been come out because of this fruit fly it will become a secondary infection right so the result will be have uh, tasting uh, some sort of fruits like uh, guava it's really common that guava is having this uh, fruit flies flavae api kiyana ne pera hema kaawun passe pera wala godak pelaada meka dakinna hambena etule panu hitiya kiyala kiyana right so what they do is that they lay eggs inside the layers of this outer cover and then the larvae will come out larvae will fully feed on the a uh, fruit portion inside the fruit flesh and then it will come to the pupal stage right so then that is how uh, uh, when when we are consuming it we will identify that this larva is present inside right so to minimize this we need to what cover the fruits right so covering means that we will uh, minimize the availability we minimize the opportunities for the Fruit fly to land on the skin of the fruit, right? If they land on the skin only, they can lay the eggs. So we will minimize the uh, opportunity uh, of them to land on the skin. So then they cannot lay eggs. Fruit covering. So fruit covering is important. Maybe you have uh, seen the fruit covering. So that is to uh, especially to protect the uh, fruit. from the pests and pheromone traps so maybe you have heard about pheromone traps so uh, different genders we will get the use of the uh, the sexuality between the females and males of this uh, fruit flies and to attract each uh, one to uh, to to another they usually secrete a kind of a chemical uh, we call them pheromones so only the opposite gender of their species will experience the sense of the pheromone so we will get that uh, use get that as an advantage to trap them right so methyl eugenol so it is the chemical that we can expect in the pheromone of this one uh, fruit fly so we will add that methyl eugenol into a kind of a cup like structure and we will allow them to enter into the uh, specific structure and we will not allow them to go away that is a kind of a trap right only entering is there no exit so it's a pheromone trap right pheromone traps can be used to uh, actually trap the adults right adult types will be adult flies so these are flies so these flies can be uh, trapped inside pheromone traps and uh, 
turns soil uh, around the plant. So that is one such important thing. So how this can be important? Why you need to turn the soil around the plant? So this is important to surrounding the plant only. How this can be happen? What is the reason? So you know that uh, if you do not harvest the fruit, it will directly um, fell down in the ground, right? So what happens uh, if they are ripening in the tree, right? If they are ripening in the tree and you are not covering the fruit as well and maybe it is much far away from your level, the high height, so then you are not being able to cover the fruit. And however, it is getting attacked by the fruit fly. And what happens? It will eventually fall down into the uh, ground, right? So the ground uh, also it is getting infected by this, infested by this larvae, right? Maybe larvae will be uh, feeding on the material, but they are in the ground, right? So there may be, uh, without our uh, notice, there may be many types of this larvae in the around the plant uh, in the soil ground so to uh, if they are they are so if there is a great uh, amount of capacity to have this larvae developed into the pupae and then the adults right so there may be many number of larvae in the ground so we need to however damage one type of crop growth in the uh, sorry, pest growth in the pest life cycle. So we can easily damage them by turning the soil. So if you turn soil, what happens? Right, they will come out of the soil and may be a target by the uh, other predators. And of course, if it is exposed to the sunlight, they may get died. Right. So then we we have to control that stage, and it is said that it is important to turn the soil around the plant. So there will be no any larvae in the ground with fallen fruits. And sanitation. So they can be uh, in the uh, unwanted material you have in your uh, ground, the field. So sanitation is important. You should not let anything inside the, uh, anything especially residues, debris, which are affected by this fruit fly damage and insecticides we can spray insecticides uh, so then we can uh, get rid of this one uh, if anything uh, doesn't work well right so this is about fruit fly and uh, mango mango cultivations so we have number of mango cultivations here uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a very uh, demanded fruit both for the local uh, market and for the exportation as well. And uh, we have uh, a kind of a disastrous condition from one pest. It's mango leaf hopper, right? Mango leaf hopper. So mango leaf will be targeted by this. It's a kind of a hopper, a kind of a lepidopteran, a moth-like structure. Here you will see the adult, right? Uh, so mango leaves, mango uh, plants are much far away from our height and uh, it's really difficult for us to control this right so what they do is that they suck the cell sap from the leaves uh, maybe from the inflorescences and young leaves so these are the the most delicate plant parts will be targeted by the pests because the cell walls and other cutaneous uh, cell uh, layers the leaf layers are much damaging in mature leaves for the attack of pests. Because of that, these uh, inflorescences, right? They are very delicate, very mild in nature. These inflorescences and young leaves have uh, much tender nature, right? Much immature nature. So it is really easy for them to attack. And uh, by their this sucking the cell sap, the fruit set will go down, right? So there will be no any photosynthesis uh, for the production of fruits then. Because of that, the fruit set, the amount of fruits that can be harvested from the plant will go down. 
and at the same time they secrete uh, we call them honeydew conditions so they secrete something uh, that is uh, sugary right which is sugary so then uh, we call this is called honeydew so honeydew is uh, not much problematic but it leads to a secondary infection because uh, uh, the secretion is sugary and it is really sweet in nature microorganisms will land on the uh, specific area and feed on that right so because of that maybe you have seen uh, the sooty mold condition uh, black color uh, powdery nature in mango leaves right uh, so if you if you are maintaining something underneath of the plant they are also getting infected by that condition right black color powdery something on the top of the uh, leaves of mango right so that is called sooty mold so sooty mold is a result of this uh, honeydew right and to control that we need to apply insecticides and it is very difficult to catch those because they are adults right then uh, citrus Right, citrus. Uh, maybe you have heard about the citrus family. Uh, so there are a number of fruits uh, in our uh, local market, and uh, different set belong to the citrus family in other countries. Citrus leaf miner. So leaf, citrus plant is getting much uh, damaged by this leaf miner. Right here, you will see how it is seen. Um, it is also a kind of a moth the adult right side picture but the damage is caused by the larvae right? it is also having uh, the lepidopteran uh, order and then they will lay eggs and uh, larvae will come out of the eggs so this larvae is like a worm and they eat the uh, the so-called mesophyll cell layer in the middle of this leaf structure so because of that we can identify their uh, damage by looking at the leaves here in the leftmost picture you will see how it seems so the roads like tunnels like structures that they have gone inside the leaf is be, uh, become visible right so they are less chlorophyll they are having less chlorophyll and because of that those tunnels are uh, seen uh, so the control will be by a predatory Vest, right? Vest, you know, the very good thing is that so there are different types of vests, so they feed on this larvae, and because of that, the population can be minimized. And chemical control, uh, fentoid is a good example, so we can apply this one uh, to the leaves, so then it will be controlled. So if you uh, find any plant part affected by the leaf miner. So this is not common for only for citrus family. Many other crops are getting leaf miner attack. Right in the in the first uh, stages, we can remove the plant part from the mother plant. So that is a good way of controlling. But if there are uh, many or higher incidents, uh, we need to go for the chemical control. Again, the same citrus family is uh, getting uh, attacked by the butterfly. Maybe you don't think that butterflies are harmful, but here this one is harmful. Right? This, this, this one maybe you have uh, seen, right? Mostly butterflies are not uh, harmful, but here in this case, these are harmful pests, right? Citrus butterfly, right? This is how you can identify. And uh, the damaging part will be they are in the larvae. Right? This is also a lepidopteran, and the larva stage will do the harm. So, larvae feed on leaves. So, here have, maybe you have seen in citrus family crops a very large bodied uh, caterpillars are there. Right? So, these caterpillars, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, their main objective is to. Uh, each eat much as they can and gather more energy. So this energy is utilized in their pupal stage. 
because pupal stage is immobile they cannot move right so they this larvae will eat whatever they find in their way right so in the right picture you will see the uh, butter uh, butterfly uh, larvae so this larvae is eating the leaf lamina right so usually in the in the nature uh, it is having natural predators from birds so birds eat this uh, large body uh, caterpillars so that is a natural uh, control by the mother nature right and uh, if you see very less amount of these attacks you can collect the plant parts and destroy right collect the uh, leaves with them uh, from few plants and then you can destroy them that is how it is uh, controlled as because their body is very large it is really easy for us to identify Then uh, another type of uh, veget uh, sorry uh, fruit crop, a uh, pineapple, pineapple mealybug. So we are having pineapple cultivations in large scale, may in many parts. Uh, mealybug. Maybe you have heard about mealybug. Uh, white color, a cotton mass like structure. Uh, they are highly populated in very less amount of time. Right, they are known as sap feeders on the fruit. So they suck the cell sap by their mother uh, uh, mouth parts, right? So they have different mouth parts that are uh, intended to suck the sap, right? We call them sap feeders. The, they are feeding on the sap. So the flesh part of the fruit or the sap will be fed by these uh, mealybugs, right? So there are a number of mealybugs. So here they are especially known as pineapple mealybugs. So they usually like to have this sap from pineapple fruits. And at the same time, as we have discussed earlier, that is one damage and another damage is coming from the uh, working as a vector, right? Working as a vector of pineapple wheat virus. So pineapple wilt virus is the uh, mainly virus attack that we have uh, identified in pineapple. So these pineapple mealybugs can act as vectors of this viral disease. So to control that, so here in this picture you will see how uh, their higher infestation is seen, right? Uh, they are highly populated uh, in a very short time. And mainly from the base, they are they usually like to have their uh, resting places or the breeding places in shady conditions. And because of that, the most base area of this uh, pineapple will be occupied by mealybug, right? And we can use the uh, use of pressurized water, right? A very high beam of pressurized water uh, can remove them away from the uh, fruit and at the same time insecticides we have insecticides to apply so then they will vanish so the same mealy bug uh, for the papaya cultivation papaya is another major crop major fruit crop in sri lanka uh, papaya mealy bug uh, so the immature and adult stages right they are they are having kind of an incomplete life cycle so both immature and the adult stages are look same, uh, but the sizes are different, right? So these adult stages, adult stages are mo mostly doing the uh, damage in mealybugs. Again, it sucks the sap from the plant, uh, especially the fruits. Uh, if they are attacking the leaves, right? The leaves become crinkled. Crinkled means a, a wavy-like structure. Uh, they are becoming uh, abnormal in the uh, nature. They are not uh, finely projected towards the light and the uh, outer portion is not smooth. They are becoming uh, wavy and crinkled. And chlorosis, as they are sucking the sap, the chlorophylls will be getting low. And because of that, the chlorosis will occur 
maybe it will turn to into uh, yellow color the green color portion turn into yellow color and uh, yellowish and wither after yellowing this withering uh, in the higher infestations these leaves are going to be withered uh, in severe in instances what happens leaf and fruit drop and death of the plant yes sometimes the plant cannot bear their damage as their damage is very high so then what happens these leaves and fruits are getting dropped in the ground so that is one thing and if the infestation is very very high what happens the total plant will go death so to control that uh, removal and burning of crop residues so you should not allow any infested plant part in your crop cultivation it should be actually burnt the burning is considered as the most effective way of removing or uh, uh, destroying something right and removal of weeds alternate host plants so in the absence of your crop in the field they can uh, rely on many other weed crops so that they are called as host plants right you should not allow any host plants in the field and at the same time in the surrounding area and natural enemies so this is also having natural enemies actually ladybird beetles and lace wings so these are common uh, in the environment but uh, if they are not we need to uh, introduce them so they will feed on them so because of that the mealybug population can be minimized and chemical control as we have discussed for pineapples this can be also chemically controlled right here you will see how they are seen so both the leaves and the fruits can be uh, infested by this mealybug right so usually the shady areas the lower most areas are occupied mostly the areas which are receiving better sunlight is not uh, much affected by this mealybug right uh, so here in the left top picture you will see in the upper uh, lower side of this leaves are occupied by this uh, population so they usually like to have shady conditions right? shady conditions and then uh, a higher population a higher population of mealybugs and in the right one uh, you you can see how uh, severe the infestation is for the fruits so the fruits become abnormal so the sap of the fruits will be uh, absorbed by these mealybugs and because of that no any proper formation maybe deformed fruits will be formed and at the same time their quality is uh, reduced and at the same time the black color black color powdery nature will be there because of the sooty mold condition right this uh, sooty mold condition is also contributing here for much drastic uh, result so this tree is highly infested by mealybug right so we have talked about major pests of fruit crops and now we will talk about major pests of vegetable crops right and uh, here we will talk about melon fly bean fly diamond back moth cabbage looper brinjal shoot and pod ball leaf mine and onion thrips so these are very common and major uh, pests found in vegetable crops uh melon fly we have talked about the fruit fly before so here the melon fly uh pactrocera cucabite right pactrocera dorsalis is the fruit fly uh pactrocera cucabite is the melon fly so as the name give, gives the meaning it act, uh, attracted towards melon even though it is melon it is not a fruit actually mainly on cucabits cucabit family cucabitaceae is a a great example for the families of vegetables right so when we talk about vegetables other than fruits we usually deal with the families right 
families are important in food uh, sorry vegetable cultivation other than the fruit cultivation so then uh, here the cucurbitaceae family cucurbitaceae is a kind of a very major uh, family in vegetable cultivations mainly the goats uh, the bitter goats snake goats likewise uh, those uh, goat families and these uh, many many type of uh, vegetables are coming under cucurbits right so this cucurbitaceae family crops are highly uh, attracted by this uh, melon fly effective flowering and fruiting stages so this is a fly so here uh, in their wings two black color dots are there so that is how we recognize melon fly from fruit flies uh, so these are affecting at the flowering and fruiting stages right so the reproductive stage of the plant is mostly targeted by the melon fly and lay eggs under the skin and larvae feed on the fruit so the same as fruit fly right? the same damage will be there so the larvae will come out uh, after they have laid eggs under the skin of the uh, specific cucurbitaceae uh, family vegetable so then the larvae feed on the fruit so, so the here uh, name fruit means here the specific vegetable right so the control as we have talked about the fruit fly wrapping can be uh, done for the fruit uh, for the specific vegetable it can be covered by a wrapping and we can go for the insecticides as well uh, then another one bean fly right beans maybe you have heard about types different types of beans are there right bean fly so beans are again attacked by this bean fly bean family the family fabaceae so this is uh, uh, much affected by the bean fly so here in the left picture you will see the fly uh, at a tip of a uh, leaf and uh, in the right side uh, you can see the uh, their specific uh, damage right and these these anim this uh, specific insect is shiny black color and uh, about 3 millimeters long fly very very a uh, small fly and it is shiny black in color and uh, they attack on beans cowpea pea green ram seedlings so their main target is seedlings so about their uh, feeding and uh, feed on stem tissue so they uh, this fly will lay eggs under the skin of the a specific uh, fruit or the pod right so usually these beans are pods right so they will uh, again damage the skin of the pod and they lay eggs inside it and then uh, the larvae will come out and they feed on the stem tissues right stem tissues will be eaten by the larvae and then it comes to the pupa stage at base right so they will uh, come to the base of the plant and they will start pupation again we have uh, insecticides to control this condition right uh, so that is how we can uh, minimize their incidence so that is about bean fly so diamond back moth Diamond back moth is a kind of a, again uh, uh, a kind of uh, a fly, a moth, right? Diamond back moth, it is a Lepidopteran. So, here in the right side picture, you will see the adult. Uh, it is having a diamond shape, uh, a kind of a sign in their back because of that diamond back moth, it, the name has given. Uh, attack on all Brassicaceae crops. Right, their target crop species is Brassicaceae crops, the cabbage family. Right, cabbages uh, are the most prominent ones in Brassicaceae family crops. So these leaves are the mostly targeted uh, crop species for diamond back moth. So they will lay eggs and the larvae come out and then start pupation and become an adult. So larvae feed on leaves from underside. 
So what they do is that they, after uh, playing eggs, so the larvae will come out and they will feed on the leaves from underside. In the left picture, you will see the uh, how the larvae is feeding on the underside of leaves. Right? These are actually worm-like structures, the caterpillars. So they will, uh, so they are damaging crop. Uh, the crop cultivation damaging stage of the cultivation will be the larvae. So, for all these uh, caterpillars, they have natural enemies, right? Natural enemies. So, we do not want to introduce them uh, in the environment. Uh, they are naturally occurring. And the sanitation, you should not keep anything uh, infested with this type of pests in your field. And chemical control. So neem seed water extract is something, an organic one, organic uh, suspension. So that can be used as a in chemical control insecticide. And novaluron, so that is a, a chemical a synthetic insecticide. So you can spray it on them. So then the larvae will die. So this is diamond back moth. Again, a cabbage looper, again, a kind of a caterpillar. Here you will see who is he. It uh, and serious based on crucifers. Again, a cruciferous family, again, a cabbage family, and the uh, uh, kind of uh, cabbage family crops is considered as crucifers. And um, this, especially, these are again attracted towards the cruciferous family. The cabbage family. And uh, this is also kind of a serious pest. Make irregular holes in leaves and feet. So they totally uh, eat the leaf part, right? So then the effective photosynthetic area of the leaf will be reduced. And then uh, almost all these caterpillars have natural enemies. So they eat them. So natural enemies are there. And uh, you can go for the chemicals as well. As a directing, so it is kind of a, a, an extract produced from neem, right? As a direct uh, means the neem, so it will be acting as a something uh, toxic material for cabbage looper. Then uh, brinjal shoot and pot borer. This is another very common uh, pest. In brinjal cultivations, shoot and pot borer. Again, it's a kind of a borer. And here you will see the adult, right? Mainly attack on brinjal and potato, right? Uh, so these are belong to family Solanaceae. So Solanaceae family crops are mainly targeted by this uh, uh, pest, right? So this is also kind of a lepidopteran. So this will uh, larvae. Larvae is in white or pink color. So they are feeding on young stems and pods. Maybe you have seen some such kind of pods affected by brinjal shoot and pod border. When you cut brinjal, inside of the brinjal, there will be brown color tunnels. Right? So this means that the fruit is damaged by the brinjal shoot and pod border. Um, so again, there are natural enemies in the natural environment. And if you see, if you, if you, in your monitoring program, if you see such kind of uh, if infect infestations, you can manually remove the plant parts. And sanitation is again important. And chemicals we can go for is like this. So here you will see uh, how the shoot portion is attacked. So even though the other mature uh, leaves are uh, they are well grown right in the middle portion you will see some withering of the middle portion right some are collapsed right here you will see how you can identify the brinjal shoot and pot borer attack so one thing is from the uh, fruit and then uh, I think you can identify the plant uh, which is affected by the brinjal shoot and pot borer by uh, the collapsing or withering of the bud portion, the middle portion, because uh, when they have attacked, right, when they have the larvae has attacked the 
uh, the young shoot portion or the fruit portion, what happens? Uh, it becomes wither. Okay? It becomes wither because their target is the young leaf portion and the uh, pods. Then the leaf miner. So leaf miner attack is very common. We have talked about citrus leaf miner before. So this leaf miner is available for vegetables as well. Right? Again, the same scenario. So mainly lower stages of dipteran insects. So we cannot say uh, what type of insect of uh, is leaf miner is because it depends on the specific uh, order of the adult. But mainly it is dipteran insects. Uh, so here you will see to it, it's very easy to identify. Uh, the middle lamina portion of the uh, leaf will be seen in white or a uh, gray color uh, because the mesophyll cell layer is totally damaged by their uh, sucking of the cell sap. So very difficult by pesticide resist to many because the reason is that this uh, specific leaf miner, it's a, it's a kind of worm-like structure, but it goes through the right middle of the leaf structure. So they are not underneath or upper uh, layer of the leaves. They are exactly in the middle portion of the middle of these uh, leaves. right? So then even though you are applying pesticide, they are not becoming contact to them. Because of that, they become resistant, right? Resistant to many of the pesticides and trap to catch adults. So, they are adults are actually usually these lepidopterans. You can, uh, if you cannot control this leaf minor here, uh, you can control the adults, the specific uh, adult order. An application of neem seed water extract. So, that is one type of an organic uh, solution so it says that uh, these are coming becoming toxic for this organic uh, condition so this neem as a director right if it uh, produce it will uh, give this uh, the toxic toxicity to the leaf miner Then onion. Onion is another, we call them condiments in vegetables, right? So onion trips. So we we'll talk about trips in the next session as well. Trips are kind of a very small insect type, but they do much harm in, in higher population. So in onion cultivations, we have the uh, problem from trips, right? Onion trips. So main host is onion. So for the onion thrips, their host plant is onion, right? There are different uh, thrip types and they have different target species, right? And uh, attack to leaves of very young plants because it is very tender. The structure is very tender and uh, attacking to them is very easy because of that very young, immature plant parts are mainly targeted by almost all these pests. Right? That is also something uh, we can see as pinheads in the uh, leaves, right? Not uh, streak like structures, not lines, but they are dot like structures, right? Dot like white color, uh, maybe light green color, uh, pinhead like structures here and there in the leaf. So we can correctly identify the onion trips attack. Uh, and we can apply chemicals uh, in the higher infestations as because the thrips are very small, we cannot manually remove them. So with that, we have come to the end. So we have talked about uh, fruits, the major pests of fruits and vegetables. And uh, actually, uh, there are many, but they, these are the very common ones. And we need to identify what they are damaged and how they are going to damage these crops and what life stages, as we have discussed for the major pests of rice, what life stages are important to be controlled. And uh, then we will be uh, able to control them, especially uh, in the sense of cultural practices. 
biological practices and uh, maybe we can go for the uh, chemical application as well but the integrated pest management maybe you have heard about IPM combination of strategies to control each and every pest is important right so we can uh, include in a, in a kind of pest management program can be produced by uh, incorporating each one of these techniques right so this is how we should identify the controlling mechanism so with that we have come to the end so i'm happy if you have any uh, questions to answer Recording stopped. So with that, uh, we have come to the end of the second session as well. Uh, if you have any questions related to this uh, major pest of fruits and vegetables, uh, if anything is uh, not much clear. So we have uh, completed two types of uh, top categories, one for the mainly the rice, and the second one is for the fruits and vegetables, uh, mainly what type of uh, insect species are considered as pests for these two categories. That is important. You should know the types. What are these uh, insect types that are considered as pests uh, for those categories? And then uh, we can identify if you have any cultivation uh, of your own, you can identify very easily uh, how their life cycle so it's important to if if you have a chance right uh to identify their life cycle so it is very interesting to see the life cycle of an insect pest uh so then you can identify the exact controlling mechanism uh as they are harming your uh, crop cultivation so for the next one we have another uh, category which is important for our uh these uh, cultivations, the agriculture, the crop cultivations. So again, we will uh, conduct another one on uh, the pest types of those type of crop categories as well. Uh, so if you do not have any uh, problem or clarification, we will have the lunch break now. And at what time you need to start the next session? So is it okay if we have uh, 45 minutes for the lunch break or you need one uh, hour? Yes. Any ideas? 45 minutes okay. Uh, sorry? 45 minutes okay. 45. Okay. Uh, hope others will also agree with the decision. Yes, 45. So we'll take from 12.30. So we'll meet at uh, then uh, 1.15. Right? 1.15 we will start the third session. So thank you very much for joining me uh, from the morning. And uh, we'll stop at this moment for the lunch break and we'll start the next session at 1.15. Okay, thank you. Fine. And if you don't understand anything reg regarded to what we have discussed for first and the second sessions, um, we can clarify them all uh, before moving to the third one. And uh, if I remember what we have discussed, uh, we have discussed about the major pest types for uh, rice, the paddy cultivation. And uh, secondly, we have talked about the pest types. Uh, we can identify easily right, as a, as a popular groups for fruits and vegetables. So thirdly, we will talk about, uh, again, uh, as pests in different crop category.
So this is for um, ornamental plants, right? Pests of ornamental plants. So uh, I think you can get an idea on what type of uh, plants I am talking about. Uh, this is directly linked with uh, the aesthetic value. So especially, uh, so I'm representing the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Gardening. So uh, crop cultivation is not just for the food consumption to provide food. Uh, it is also uh, a kind of a thing that we can uh, address uh, for the gardening, uh, landscaping activities, uh, the beautification of the indoor and outdoor environment. So all these are coming uh, under horticulture. So ornamental plants, especially uh, most of them are annuals uh, or biennials. So these ornamental plants, uh, maybe some are perennials, of course, and uh, especially uh, these uh, annuals and biennials are mostly affected by the pest and diseases. So here I think you all can see some uh, mostly common uh, species in Sri Lanka. Um, the bougainvillea, so it, it's a kind of a uh, flowering plant, a bush-like structure is there in the plant and mostly uh, used in gardening activities. And in the middle, uh, calathea, maybe you have seen this plant, it's a common foliage plant in foliage plant industry. And in the rightmost corner, uh, gerbera, uh, it's a cut flower used in cut flower industry. Uh, likewise, the beautification of the environment is totally uh, a kind of a important thing uh, when it comes to the crop production other than for food production for every type of crop. So we will now talk about uh, recording in progress pests of ornamental plants. So all these ornamental plants are also getting affected by the pest and diseases. So not only the uh, food related uh, crops but also these uh, ornamental plants. But, uh, so the mainly the aesthetic value is targeted. So we'll see uh, what type of pests we can categorize uh, for many of these ornamental plants. So if we take a look at uh, what are considered as ornamentals, uh, grown for ornamental purposes. Ornamental means uh, it it's kind of a, a value, it is a kind of a value uh, which we target for the improvement of the environment, the quality of the environment, right? the aesthetic value. And grown in gardens or indoors. So both areas can be targeted for ornamental plants. Uh, uh, maybe you have heard about interior and exterior landscaping, right? So gardening concepts are there. So uh, there are many principles, um, uh, maybe some practices, techniques that we can use, apply. So proper techniques and applications should be applied for different scenarios, uh, whether it is exterior or in interior design. So most commonly for flowers, leaves, uh, maybe for the aroma it gives or the scent, uh, fruit and no stem. So these parts of the aerial environment parts will be mostly targeted for the ornamental uses. Purpose is the enjoyment of gardeners and visitors. So it's a, it's a kind of an enjoyment uh, to please somebody uh, when it comes to uh, whatever the person who is visiting the area. Right, so that is the main target, the main purpose, and also used in landscaping. Landscaping activities can be perfectly done by ornamental plants. So we'll see uh, who are the major uh, species of pests. Uh, maybe you have seen these ones, so they are very common. Um, I think almost all the areas of the country have these pests. Uh, trips. Aphids, mealybugs, mites, scales, caterpillars, and slug and snails. So these are very common. And depending on the environmental conditions, maybe their existence is low. Uh, but many of the parts of the island, uh, I think, know about these uh, different pest types. So we'll see uh, one by one. Uh, thrips. Maybe you have heard about the thrips. So thrips is very small, 
so it's a kind of an insect uh, which is very small maybe you can see in the right side picture it is the length will be about 1 mm right uh, so maybe uh, more millimeters will be occupied uh, in very several uh, numbers not more than uh, 5 right uh, so that much of small animals or insects are uh, termed as thrips so these are uh, very minute and at the same time they are not available in single numbers they are behaving as a population right so colors color variation is there uh, actually it is very uh, maybe may many colors yellow light brown banded or black banded means uh, two different colors are uh, banding uh, as stripes right so likewise there is a kind of a variety of colors and uh, what they do is that they they are mouth parts how they damage is that they have rasping type mouth parts apigena me singhile surana kela surala thamai egolo me damage karanne me surala yalata ona dewal e yage me muko pang walata laba ganna rasping we call it rasping right so uh, many of the body parts of the plant are infested by these uh, thrips and once they have done the damage the specific plant part become curled or distorted so distortion means a kind of a misshapen behavior the proper shape or the form that we expect from the specific plant part will be not there right maybe it, it, the nature will be uh, a curled like structure it is getting short and the shape will be misshapen uh, so this this uh, nature will be known as distortions right curled or distorted with silver gray scars or callused areas right so uh, silver gray color scars will be there because when they rasp the plant parts the sap of the uh, specific cells will be extracted to their bodies so with that many of the green color parts especially if it is green color or at the same time these are attacking to flowers and fruits are also right so they have different colors so whatever the color it is it may be vanished and silver gray color scars will be there because that that area has been rasped the specific uh, a, a, a kind of a color is there to give the color for that uh, plant part so all this liquid the, the kind of a juice like structure is there for the color this juice is uh, absorbed into their bodies right so with their damage these areas the areas which are damaged will produce callous areas a kind of a, a callus we call it a callus a kind of a uh, tumor like area so likewise that will be a kind of a reaction that plant have for the uh, damage that they have done and transmit viruses to many ornamental so they are acting as again uh, i think i have mentioned that their damage is the first hand damage and at the same time they act as vectors right they transmit especially the viral uh, diseases from one plant to another so this is what uh, it is shown the how it is shown in uh, the uh, parts of the plant parts uh, especially in the rose cultivation uh, if it uh, damages the rose flowers what happens uh, so the color the exact color of the rose petals will be vanished and because of their damage it becomes brown right it becomes brown color and as i have mentioned earlier these are not behaving as single insects uh, usually a population will be there in any part so then uh, the whole population will do the damage and because of that damage uh, the damaged plant part will turn into brown color so in the right hand side it's a kind of a chrysanthemum api na kapuru kela kapuru kule thena malak so this chrysanthemum uh, type flower is also what has uh, affected by these strips there you can see some the perfect orange color is vanished in some areas and uh, gray white color spots are there 
uh, in large quantities in several areas. So this is a sign of thrips damage. And if you want to see them uh, in, in Sri Lanka, it is very common in, uh, so there's a kind of a plant called Ficus benjamina. Maybe, maybe uh, the benjamina plant is very common. Benjamina term is very common. So this uh, plant usually have this uh, thrips in this plant, right? So a uh, ficus plant damaged by thrips, usually most of these benjamina plants are damaged by thrips attack. So if you so look at a kind of a plant of uh, ficus benjamina, so they are uh, leaves actually, they have been uh, uh, closed, like closed in nature. So they are not uh, spreaded totally uh, towards the light. And they are sometimes, uh, the two edges are fastened. So if you uh, remove that fastened edges and see inside, you will see number of thrips inside. Right. So that is uh, a very common um, condition in Benjamina uh, plants. And they are, you can see them very easily. So when it comes to damage, appearance varies with the host plant. So as I have mentioned earlier, if it is a foliage plant, uh, a fruit or flower. So the appearance become very because uh, the specific color will vanish, right? And they prefer to feed on very young succulent parts. So all these um, pests, most of these pests are much attracted towards the very young succulent parts, the immature parts. So it may be immature fruits, flowers or foliage. So all these immature plant parts are targeted to these thrips. Because it is very easy for them to extract the uh, sap. And both the adult and the immature. So these are having a kind of a, a incomplete life cycle. So adult and the immature, the nymph and the adult, both will feed on the plant parts. Uh, especially within unopened anthurium. Anthurium cultivation is a kind of a cut flower cultivation. And at the same time, uh, potted plants are also there. So these uh, flowers, mostly the flowers are attacked by thrips. Uh, so if the anthurium flower is still unopened, so we call the spathe, what we can see as colored petal, the spathe, uh, so they attack to them as well. So white streaks or scary uh, lines can be seen if they have attacked, right? Deformed spathe with uh, age bronzing of injured tissue. So the next thing is, uh, in the early stages, this damage can be seen in a white or gray color, uh, silver color like uh, color. So when the time goes by, as this is an injury to the plant, it becomes bronze color or the brown color. Uh, in severe cases, these uh, flowers, mainly the almost all flowers, fail to open. Right? If it is uh, very severe in damage, it fails to open um, and it remains as a bud. Right? And foliage deformed, bronzing, and streaking both can be seen in foliage. And reduced plant growth. In severe infestations, uh, for almost all crop types, they reduce plant growth. In here, you will see uh, how their damage is for the leaves of anthurium. Uh, so, it's a kind of a, a complex of uh, things in this leaf cultivate leaves of this anthurium cultivation. Uh, at the same time, their uh, cultivation is not much healthy, and at the same time, uh, mostly the thrips damage have been found in this cultivation. Uh, Mainly the bronze color, the brown color areas are totally because of this strips attack. Right? It's a heavier infestation. And when it comes to uh, the unopened spathers of anthurium, here you will see thrips damage in anthurium flower bud. Right? It is not open, it is an unopened bud. But here you won't see the exact color. Some areas are uh, rasps, rasped by the uh, Thrips and the perfect color producing areas are now absent. And if it is this uh, is produced for export market, this will not be accepted as a good exportable product. 
right so if uh, if a grower or a farmer is intending to do uh, a cultivation targeting export market this type of flowers will not be accepted so here are some more uh, flowers uh, which are open thrips damaged in anthurium flower so this uh, damage is done for the open flowers right so see the uh, color difference in spade right so the spade then the spadings so these two uh, parts are there in anthurium flower uh, spadix is what the, you can see in the middle as a, a column. Uh, spade is the uh, petal like structure that gives color. And uh, there's no any uniform color in these flowers. They are uh, ununiform, they are, they are not even. Uh, some areas are highly affected by the thrips attack. So these are not accepted. Uh, even for the local market as well, no one likes to buy these type of flowers. And uh, if you get any flowers from your cultivation like this, so you cannot market that uh, for a good value. So these are uh, thrips damage in dendrobium orchids, right? Orchid uh, flowers are also targeted by these thrips. Uh, here you will see how they have attacked uh, flowers and leaves of orchid right uh, the perfect color the green color is vanished in leaves and uh, the purple color in petals of orchid is absent right this is the damage how they are seen madam trips can kudito the oh api kudito kiyala thama kiyanne kudito kiyala kiyenawa thawa ुडा <laughs> Right, uh, so let's see how we can control this uh, non chemical control. Uh, yes, we initially go for the non chemical control. So, biological control is there in the nature. Uh, so, predators, right, predatory attack is there, certain lace wings. So, lace wing is a kind of a, a predatory uh, a kind of an insect. And ladybird beetles, predatory mites, and ants. Some ants are also eating these. Uh, thrips, right? Uh, so these are acting as predators, uh, and several fungi. Some fungi species have found if they eat these fungi, they get died, right? And these are biological control methods, um, and uh, cultural methods. What we can do for the cultural. Uh, Methods remove infested flowers and foliage. Uh, what we can do is removal, of course, but uh, this should be done in the very early stages. So that is the most uh, important thing you should know. Uh, if the infestation is very high, it is very hard for you to identify the plant parts to remove. Right? Maybe whole plant is now occupied by this uh, tips, right? So you need to have a good monitoring practice. If, if not, you will not find in their early incidental. So remove infested flowers, foliage both, right? Any part, any part of the plant, if it is uh, uh, infested by several, very few number of trips, you need to remove them. and. Uh, Control weeds, grass, and all stock plants. If you have all stock plants, it's a kind of a good uh, 
especially these all stock plants are something that you are maintaining to get the planting materials so unlike your specific cultivation they are they are in the field for a very long time so if they are very old you need to remove these stock plants because that is something uh, we do in ornamental plant industry so when you have a kind of a cut flower uh, cultivation or foliage cultivation maybe a potted plant cultivation uh, especially the farmers or the growers what they do is that uh, not like fruits vegetables or rice uh, they have their own cultivations which have done previously and when they need planting materials they used to get them from that cultivation they, that is called uh, mother stock uh, cultivation mother stock plants so these uh, plants are there for a longer time and thereby these uh, trips can be there uh, even the cultivation is not started right so those type of plants the old mother stock plants and weeds grasses so they can act as host plants because of that all these should be uh, actually removed actually uh, from the field uh, use thrips free propagative materials when we get propagative materials uh, we need to uh, make them pest free or the thrips free right if you are getting something uh, a, a kind of a planting material from a person uh, which is having thrips it will be a, the starting point of the सामान्य सीवीए डैमेज का अपनों भी बालागण पुलवा ना बहुत ऑनवेंटल प्लांट सोल्डर ये अलग ही सीवीए डैमेज का आती है ना अने ही मतलब आप क्या ने पहले मैं कहूँगी हाँ नहीं है आह कोड़ी तंड अभी क्या ना आह ए फिक्स ए फिक्स लगे लगा माय अभी क्या ने अभी इस तरह टेबल लोगे ना पता कर दो सो इट्स डिफरेंट टाइप uh phytotoxicity right phytotoxicity may occur uh under hot dry and conditions phytotoxicity uh, means something uh a toxic condition which is raised by this chemical right so very hot dry conditions will cause some sort of toxic conditions for the plants so we should not apply uh, under very hot dry conditions uh these chemicals so if if so if it is if so it will create a kind of phytotoxicity in plants so these are uh, chemicals uh, actually these are pesticides these can be used to control the higher infestations then uh, actually the aphids if you are called it okay by aphids so it's a different uh, type of uh, pests and at the same time as like the thrips they have a very high infestation in uh, ornamental plant industry uh, common troublesome insects so these are very troublesome if they are not maintained very well if the if the conditions are not monitored uh, so they when they are uh, when we consider about their morphology they are pear shaped soft bodied uh, insects right you know pears ge diyaga wage hadeyak thiyenne फोटोग्राफी uh and it may lead to dark brown as well and may go undetected in severe infestations um uh, honeydew and sooty mold so i have mentioned about honeydew so especially some insects they secrete some sugary substances so this is called honeydew so that is not actually uh, a harm for us but uh 
a kind of microorganisms will um, have this honeydew as their feeding material and because of that it will grow on that excreta or the substance sugar substance and then um, they will cover the photosynthetic area the productive leaf area uh, usually this is black color we call it sooty right so it's a fungus uh, this fungi species this fungal species will uh, have this honeydew as their feeding material so however it will uh, cover the whole upper portion of the leaves mostly and then the photosynthetic area will go down so that is uh, what happens and if these conditions are here uh, usually these aphids are go unnoticed because they cannot be seen because of the black color right and attack on many plants ornamental vegetables and fruits so the attack is there as thrips for every type of uh, crop categories so their infestations can lead to distorted new growth right? they also uh, target the new growths of the plants because they are very tender very immature easy to attack so distortions the misshapen behavior and weak plants the plant vigor will go down and in extreme cases stunted growth can be seen in the uh, plantlets or the seedlings in in very early stages of the crop growth if these aphids are going to attack their growth will be stunted so these are the ones uh, that are known as aphids i think you all have seen these ones right aphids uh, mostly they prefer to uh, be in a kind of lower uh, most areas which are shady uh, not exposed to the sunlight and may, mainly the lower parts of the leaves flowers uh, so they again suck the cell sap right so in a population different uh, stages of the uh, growth cycle can be seen maybe uh, along with other types of uh, pests as well so they are not alone in uh, plant parts there may be some other pests as well right so this is how they are seen uh, especially uh, in, in um, ornamental plant industry they are very common in very few plants uh, we call them a colony right a population of uh, aphids a population of uh, these pests are known as colony colony of aphids on rose flowers so this is very common maybe you have seen them in rose flowers uh, especially surrounding the rose buds and the newly opened flower buds so they are much attracted towards the new growths uh, the new tender parts and because of that other than in the mature parts these aphids are much uh, high in population surrounding the buds and uh, hedera helix is a kind of a, a foliage creeper it's a vine uh, so the lowermost picture there also you will see in the tender portion uh, um, about black color uh, aphids are there so it's it's another existence maybe the species is different but these all these are aphids right they suck the cell sap from the tender parts so to control them uh, relatively easy to control uh, not like uh, thrips actually we can control these aphids and natural parasites and predators are there in the natural environment and uh, we can wash off using a forceful stream of water if not a pressurized water stream we can wash them right and we can also in uh, apply insecticides like these these are very common and this is how we can uh, get rid of them and if you notice them in the early stages in the incidence you can remove the plant parts then uh, mealybugs we have talked about mealybugs uh, in pineapple mealybugs but uh, mealybugs are everywhere so they attack to many of the plant types and uh, these are actually appear as white cottony masses 
they are very uh, most of them are white in color and uh, a cotton like structure cotton like appearance texture is there in their body and also as we have mentioned earlier also uh, air feed strips so these mealy bugs are also behaving as a population they are they are not acting as single uh, pests they have a population right so all together it when it comes to all together it's like a, a cottony mass we can pulum goda kagida ma pen they are very common in leaf axis right uh, the leaf uh, the petiole section of the leaf uh, and the lower surfaces of leaves and the uh, mainly on the roots right mainly the shady areas of the plant will be occupied by mealy bugs and uh, these are very common uh, in the presence of this honeydew sooty mold conditions so if any part of this honeydew and sooty mold is found so that usually is occupied by again mealy bugs and infested plants become stunted severe infestations parts begin to die they are also uh, doing a very high uh, damage they can suck the cells up very fast and uh, if it is a kind of a immature plant it will do more harm and uh, we can use a pressurized water column or else we can apply some insecticides here you will see how they are seen a single one and a, a kind of a population how we can see them so they are very common in the underside of the leaves leaf axis leaf petioles right uh shady areas shady uh, very quiet shady areas will be much preferred by the uh, mealy bugs so here uh, mainly this is very common in hibiscus plant right what the what the shake what the gas then ay vai godak pelata inna this is how they are seen they are not acting as one single uh pest they are acting as a population and it takes very little time for uh, for them to increase their population then uh, another type mites mites kela kiyana mite aao kela kiyanne um actually there are different species there are not any uh, single species that do the harm uh um, they are very tiny actually they are microscopic organisms maybe we can identify uh, as a very tiny dot like structure from our eyes but to have the specific idea of their morphology we need to uh, use the microscope right so this is a microscopic uh, view of mites they are uh, from that only we can identify the specific uh, parts of the uh, mite to categorize them under different categories uh, they are also sucking insects suck the cell sap and at the same time they act as viral vectors so here uh, how they are seen like this very very uh, tiny we cannot uh, specifically these uh, parts of the body cannot be identified correctly by our eyes right and they are very small unnoticed until severe damage as they cannot be seen by our eyes we cannot identify their damage until they are coming into a very high population that is an disadvantage uh, damage foliage turn yellow or become speckled right again the same type of uh, damage will be there they they, are, they they will they will damage the foliage and the damage will turn into as they are sucking the cell sap the greenery nature will be uh, lower and uh, they become speckled a kind of a distortion right wavy appearance ring wrinkled appearance will be there at high density uh, we can easily find their high density of population by webbing webbing uh, means api kiyana makulu dalak wage දැලක් බඳිනවා මෙයා ඒ දැලෙන් තමයි හොයා ගන්න පුළුවන් මයිට්ස්ලා ඉන්නවා කියලා if not we cannot identify single mites uh, we can easily find their presence by webbing 
so they as a population make a web underneath of the uh, mostly the underneath of the uh, leaves right so it's better if you have a cultivation do check the underside of the leaves because number of pest types can be identified by underside of the leaves uh, and loss of leaves uh, by the higher amount of sucking of cell sap some leaves fall down and uh, maybe in severe cases the the whole plant will die and uh, especially this is a very common uh, application sulfur dust application of sulfur dust can be used to control mite right they are much resist uh, susceptible for sulfur dust so they will get died right and abamectin, so it's a chemical, it's an insecticide. So that can be used if you need to have them uh, when no other works well. So here you will see uh, how their damage is seen. Very tiny uh, spots, a lot of spots in a very uh, close area uh, can be identified. So two spotted spider mite is a kind of a one type, one, one category. Two spotted spider mites attack in impatient leaves. Impatient is a kind of a um, potted plant. So this spotted plant uh, has been infested by these uh, mites. So it seems like uh, chlorosis, but it is not chlorosis or any other nitrogen deficiency. Maybe uh, if we do not correctly identify this, maybe we, we come across with deficiency symptoms as well, uh, but they are not, right? We need to correctly identify their presence. So this mite uh, attack is very common again in rose plants, right? damage to rose flower by spider mites. So many of the... Uh, Flowers may be totally covered by webbing and might send their webbing on leaf or frost. So these are these webs are made by mites. Right? So this is not the spiders that we know. This is the webs made by mites. So here and there are very tiny uh, dot-like structures can be seen. So those are the mites, but our eyes are unable to identify them very correctly with their body parts. So we need to uh, take one or two under the microscope to correctly identify their presence. Maybe I think you have seen these uh, conditions maybe in your home gardens. Uh, so you need to get some action. If not, uh, the plants will get mostly affected by their presence. Uh, then uh, we have another one. The scales, right? Scales is a, is a kind of another type of a, maybe you have seen those things, scales. Uh, these are another type of a pest that we have in most ornamental plant species. Uh, they are also sucking insects because of that uh, sucking the sap. Weakened standard or depth of the plant can be expected as we have uh, discussed. Most of them are sucking insects and they feed on leaves petiole stems, right? So these areas will be mostly targeted, uh, the petioles and the stems part, right? So mostly common in these hard areas of the plant. And round to oval shape uh, shapes are there in these uh, body types. And color varies from white or light to dark brown, right? Uh, we can use insecticides to control them. So here are the scales. I think you all have seen these, right? Mainly the uh, mature parts, mature parts of the plant will be targeted by them. Uh, there's a color variation, a uh, very high color variation. Uh, so they are very tightly attached to the plant part. It is really hard to remove them. And they have uh, very tight uh, kind of a outer cover, right? Out, outer cover is sometimes shiny and dark color. Light color ones are also there. And uh, 
it is difficult to remove them. We need to make some force to remove them. Right? They are tightly attached and suck in the sap. Then uh, caterpillars. Maybe we have talked about much about caterpillars. Uh, so they are worm-like structures, but uh, their body size will be different. Right? So if you can see in these two pictures, some are uh, feeding on leaves and some are on petals. Right? Both are actually having a greater uh, bad impact on these ornamental plants because leaves and flowers are both equally important in ornamental plant industry. So, larval stages of moths and butterflies. So, uh, what we used to know as, uh, used to call as caterpillars are the larval stage of many moths and butterflies. So, we don't know actually what the species is, but uh, all the caterpillars you see in the environment are the larval stages of some a type of a uh, this complete life cycle of a species. So that, that is the thing we can say. Mostly they belong to the moths and butterflies. Right? So these large size caterpillars are usually the moths and butterflies and many non-specific caterpillars. So by looking at caterpillars, we cannot say that exactly the species. We need to identify the specific characteristics of the a caterpillar to identify its correct species. Uh, large chunks achieved from new leaves and buds. So again, this one also uh, much attracted towards the immature uh, tender plant parts. Maybe it is buds, leaves, flowers, right? So caterpillars means a kind of a very general term. There is no specific one type of caterpillar. So in these two pictures also you will see the uh, morphology is different. Right? But we, if we need to identify what is the uh, correct species, we need to identify their uh, correct morphology and then we can categorize into which species it belongs to. To control the best practice, check every day and pick off. Right, So that is very easy because they are in large uh, body size. Right? We can easily find them. Many, many flowering plants are much infected by those type of very large caterpillars. So these caterpillars can easily uh, remove by manual removal uh, if you notice them in the very correct stage. And spray bacillus thuringiensis, uh, maybe you have heard about this one, BTI, right? This is known as BTI, uh, reapplied frequently. Have you heard about Bacillus thuringiensis before in any uh, subject? Or, uh, yes. What, yes. What, are, what does this do? What is happening? Jaiva Palibodhana Shakya Kvidhiyat. Oh. Palibodhana Shakya Kvidhiyat. So it's a bacteria. So what happens? So spray Bacillus thuringiensis on top of the plants. What happens then? विनाश कर එතකොට වෙන්නේ මෙයාගේ ආහාර මාර්ග පද්ධතිය බිඳ වැටෙනවා මෙයාට ගොඩක් බඩගින් ඉන්න වෙනවා කන්න බෑ ඒ කියන්නේ මේ කැටපිලර් ටිකක් ගියාම ලෙඩ වෙනවා යාව එයාට කන්න බැරු යනවා එයාගේ මේ ඇතුල ඩැමේජ් වෙන නිසා එයාගේ ආහාර මාර්ග ජීර්ණ පද්ධතිය වැඩ කරන්නේ නැතුව යනවා හරියට මෙයාට කන්න බැරි වෙලා මෙයා මැරෙනවා හරි so the caterpillar will get affected by its digestive system so it will be damaged by bacillus thuringiensis right it will the, the walls of the uh, digestive system will be damaged by bacillus thuringiensis because of that uh, it will have to starve uh, so these uh, caterpillars will die because of the starvation uh, so that is how this bacillus thuringiensis is used to 
control caterpillars. So it's a biological control. It is known as biological control. So uh, without the feeding material for Bacillus thuringiensis, it will not be there for a very long time. So we need to reapply them frequently. biological control control टेक्निकेसाई Uh, so if the pest is available that is fine if not uh, if we have uh, especially these predators are very high in uh, cost and if you are intending to release some predators to your crop cultivation you need to think about their feeding material unless uh, it is having this pest for their feeding material what else you can provide uh, for them for the predators if not predators will die right if there are no any feeding material for predators they will get die so there is no point of uh, buying them and applying them to your cultivation because uh, we do not expect their death we we do need to make them alive and pest to die right so that is the case and uh, if not we can go for the insecticides and we can apply uh, them in correct uh, recommendation the concentrations and actually the slugs and snails right so i think you know the difference here you will see uh snails you know golubello you know golubello and thena or kavachya so the snails have a kind of a have a very high uh, a hard exterior portion a shell like structure so that is how we recognize the snails and uh, slugs actually slugs don't have that sort of a um, exterior outer cover they are very uh, tender and very uh, slurry nature sluggish nature, nature will be there and only the skin portion is there as the outer cover and they are uh, damage right so slugs and snails both together do the same harm right they feed on leaves and tender stems etc right so again these are also uh, find in the very tender portions because uh, they have large number of teeth even we cannot see uh, they have large number of teeth in their mouth and they eat or, or really eat uh, maybe large, large chunks of these uh, leaves as caterpillars will be eaten by them and uh, they chew them right they will hop and pull on hop la kanna pull on so for this section this tender portions are very much uh, needed for both of them right so then uh, they will so here you will see the damage right uh, so they eat the whole productive area the total productive area will be eaten so we need some amount of photosynthesis as well because uh we expect the flowering stage so it requires some amount of um, energy for the plant to enter into the reproductive phase from vegetative phase so if the productive area is less so it will be a problem so to control them we can collect and destroy if there is lesser amount we can collect them and destroy uh all the uh, actually uh, the damaged parts along with the uh, the specific snail so this uh, slugs we can remove them uh, from the field condition and we can also have some kind of traps we call them baits right ama kapi kena ama 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 dano kiyala ama vidita api pavich karana so there is a kind of two types meta meta is something uh, uh that we can get from the shops it is available and uh, 
if you apply meta so it is very common everyone knows that so they uh, become dyed because of that application and alcohol at the same time it's a trap so if you put some alcohol uh, to a kind of a, uh, a small container and keep in the field so the snails and slugs come into this alcohol trap so they do not get dyed uh, they like to have that taste right so then they will collect it in the alcohol trap it's a trap and the meta will actually uh, make them die and at the same time salt so salt is a kind of a distractor it's a kind of a repellent right uh, salt so they do not like salt so if you put a kind of salt line so they do not cross that line right so that's a kind of a repellent activity so likewise these these actions can be taken to control um these uh, snails and slugs so for an example uh, in orchid cultivation uh, their presence is very high as this uh, moist conditions uh, very high humidity and the moisten conditions in orchid cultivations is very favorable for them as well because these snails and slugs are much uh, available in the uh, wet zone actually in the wet moistened conditions so in the areas of this having wet conditions moistened humidity so they like to have that condition and at the same time they will feed on the planting material so in orchid industry uh, these snails and slugs are the most disastrous it is considered as the most disastrous pest condition in orchid industry right so these conditions are vary for different sectors but these are the very common uh, pests found in the ornamental plant industry which are very problematic right if you do not consider and monitor very well because in ornamental plant industry the next most thing is that um, the density of the cultivation is very high right so if one get attacked by the pest so it will very fast uh, transmitted to another right if it is a commercial business it's a commercial uh, ornamental plant industry so it will be a massive damage that uh, sometimes the cost of production will go very up and uh, then the marketable value will go down so that is something uh, important when it comes to maintenance of commercial ornamental plant industries so it is very common uh, that we can do many manual methods in home level home scale level in our home gardens but it is not the same as for a uh, commercial uh, maintenance so in commercial cultivations we have large number of plants together in a very limited area so once get uh, attacked the others will get the attack very easily in a very short time period so then we need to have uh, a good monitoring program and we need to have more labor more people uh, to apply those uh, control methods and to have these monitoring activities in ornamental plant industry uh, so that's it so with that i have come to the end as well so with that we have uh, completed the first second and third sections and all together we have discussed about pests in different categories uh, so i'm happy if you have any questions you can ask uh, so the first two the first two categories were uh, mainly considered for the food related productions so it is important that it will damage the food crop the food related crops because it will do some damage for our food because uh, the rice fruits and vegetables are uh, considered as uh, food for humans right so it will directly impact the pest damage will directly impact for our food that is why we need to take action in the presence of this pest attack for those food crops but here uh, in this session this one is for the ornamental effect but that is also important as uh, every crop is not intended for providing food right so these crops are 
the specific ornamental plant industry plants are uh, intended to give us a kind of a pleasure, a beautification. So that is also important. But uh, as they are raised in artificial environment and uh, in, in under the human influence, there is a great uh, probability of having pest attacks because it is not in the nature natural environment anymore right maybe if you are having one or two plants in the garden that will be not problematic because naturally the pests will be uh, controlled because they every pest has its own natural predator right so they will be available in the natural environment but the studying of these pest and pest damages and their controlling mechanisms is important when you maintain a commercial uh, practice because it is under human control right so in the natural environment even though there are uh, natural predators in the artificial environment we won't incorporate those in our environment so that is why uh, we cannot uh, usually sometimes control the whole lot of these damages and incidences so what we need to identify is that uh, we need to correctly identify the damage, right? So we should not complicate them with uh, any deficiency symptoms, any other physiological disorders of the plant, or any any other kind of a disease condition. Uh, we should correctly identify the pest and the pest damage. And then uh, only we can go for the correct controlling strategy. If not, it will do a kind of a uh, economic threat. So that is the thing we need to identify and I wanted to give you from these three sessions. So I'm happy if you have any questions to ask uh, so I can answer them. So as we have done these three, if you have any uh, cultivations on your own, please uh, do have a look. So now you know what type of uh, pests we can uh, maybe suspect from these cultivations. Maybe now you can think of uh, if you have been given a kind of a task to find uh, or identify a new pest that uh, others don't know or uh, maybe your friends may be asking you to have some information on pests. So now you can suspect or you can give a kind of a uh, guidance on whether this may be the pest that you are talking about and this may be the controlling strategies so you should know what type of controlling strategies are there and how they could be applied so i think you have got some information and uh, at the same time the classifications and the pest and disease the overview for the pest and diseases all are important when it comes to the correct identification because identification is the most important thing uh, other than uh, that uh, the next stages are the application of the correct controlling strategy so at the same time i should remember that uh, every controlling strategy should be nature friendly right so that is why uh, we usually not recommend the pesticide application in the first sense so those are actually synthetic chemicals that have been produced and uh, many argue that they have different uh, negative impacts to our health as well. So we should not encourage the application of pesticides in the first sense. That is the uh, maybe the last way, the, the, the final out way of getting rid of these uh, pest attacks, not the first to the um, any other first hand uh, our applications so we should get uh, nature friendly mechanisms to get away from these pests otherwise it may sometimes the large quantity of application of large concentrations will make sure that you are getting uh, that the humans are getting more vulnerable impacts by the pesticides so uh, other than that, we need to have some uh, monitoring practices and other ways. Maybe the organically produced 
uh, maybe we have discussed about the neem extract. So that is something having a very various amount of uh, applications because it's a uh, organic natural repellent, right? Acidiractin is the chemical that it has, the neem. So we have uh, many wide applications. It is now on the shops as well, sell. So if we can go to that sort of natural, nature-friendly applications, we can get rid of these uh, ones very easily. And uh, we need to get some more actions to have nature-friendly ways to get out of these tests. So that is what uh, I was uh, intended to give you. Um, so if you have any questions, you can raise. If not, we can wind up the session. So thank you very much for all uh, for being with me for these three sessions. Hope you got an idea. And if you need any uh, help regarding these three, uh, you can access me. And uh, again, thank you very much. And I will stop at this point and have a nice day. Thank you.